Good evening, everyone. Uh, here we are at our Thursday, January 9th, 2020 meeting, uh, where we are going to have a public hearing on our budget for FY21, as well as our regular meeting. Um, I would like to call the meeting to order. And those present and willing to please join in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America, America and, and to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next order of business is a public hearing, FY21 budget. I'd like to call the public hearing open. Dr. Kavanaugh, would you please present um, some highlights of our budget, please? Sure. You must have been scrolling through. Sorry. Sorry. All right, so I'll just go through these slides very quickly because we had done them all last week. Um, but for folks in the audience who may be interested in seeing these, who are folks who are paying um, attention at home, we can run through them one more time. So this is our fiscal year 21 budget presentation. It was made originally uh, last week. We're reviewing it this week for the public hearing. And as we prepared the FY21 budget, there were lots of things for us to think about. We wanted to ensure that we were offering our students level services of all of our exceptional academic and extracurricular programs. So our programming was not cut in any way. If there's any um, Additions to our programming, those things would have come to us this year through grant funding. And naturally, we'll be looking for grant funding um, for other things again next year. Um, our curriculum and instruction needs to meet the needs of every single learner um, in the Hopkinton Public Schools. And you know how different every child is. Um, Adolph Brown would tell us every student is a study of one. And so our budget needs to match that. Uh, we are adding teachers, special educators, and, su and support staff to accommodate increases um, in our student population. We want to ensure that all of our buildings, our school facilities, support the maximal growth for all children. We want to support the growing social and emotional needs of our students. Um, and as we've said repeatedly, SEL is one of our district goals and has been for a very long time. And we want to make sure that this budget is in line with all of the five buildings, five principal school improvement plans. So along the way, there were some challenges. Naturally, increased enrollment is a challenge because it's happening to us so quickly that we are struggling to keep pace. Uh, we have increased transportation needs with more students, come more buses. We have additional social emotional learning programs. Hopefully, we will be opening 14 new classrooms. There will be modular classrooms at Elmwood and Hopkins, and then new classrooms on this building. We need to safeguard instructional excellence, and we always have to respond to unfunded mandates. Just to give you a little idea of the enrollment growth, when we submitted our SIMS data to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education in October of 2015, we had 3,463 students on the rolls. And when we did that in 2019, we had 3,862 students. So through October 1st, 2019, there were 399 additional students. We are currently over 400. And one of the other things that I should mention about the preparation of this budget, so we prepare it with those 399 in mind. But as we take a look at some of these projections, um, these are our current actuals. And they give you a sense of, over 10 years, the growth of a single class. So for example, the 2009-2010 kindergarten class was at one time 198 students. And as it got projected out for 10 years, we now have 291 students in that same class. But if you look at this next slide, the projected enrollments for next year will show you that there will be a market increase in our, our student uh, body for next year. And so when we prepare this budget for you know, the students who are sitting in front of us, we also have to take into account that there'll be a couple hundred more students with us next year. Uh, if you follow out the 2021 kindergarten class at an estimated number of 275, over 10 years' time, we imagine that those students will grow to a class of 411 students. 
And the total growth in the Hopkinton Public Schools will be 4,856, at least according to that estimate. Next year's estimated enrollment is 4,111 students. This slide simply shows you how many students in each grade entered the Hopkinton Public Schools and how many exited over the course of the year. If you look at grades 1, 2, 3, and 4, uh, as well as grade 8, you can see that we have added at least a class of students to each one of those grades. What you see on this slide are the per pupil expenditures for last year, according to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. In 2017, Hopkinton was ranked number 24. Our per pupil expenditure was $14,557.98. And so you can see us compared to other districts, districts with whom we like to compare ourselves, districts that are close to us geographically. Um, and you know where we fall in terms of state rankings. Uh, we are typically in the top five to ten all the time, and you can see that with these chosen districts, our per pupil expenditure is ranked at 24. So I like to say all the time that Hopkinton students are getting a lot of bang for their buck, and you can see that we are even below state average, which is 15,458 per student. In 2018, Hopkinton is 27th on the same list. Again, we are still under state average. Uh, we are at just at 15,000, and uh, state average is $16,506. So people will ask the question, how are you faring despite the you know, increases in enrollment and um, the uh, difficulty that the district is having keeping pace with that? If you looked at last year's graph that looks very similar to this one, you would see that we are in just about the same place. So when we look at, some, at those green cells, for example, it means that we are in the top 5% statewide. If the cell is orange, we are in the top 6 to 10% statewide. And if the cell is pink, we are in the top 11 to 13% statewide. So when we look at being seventh in the state, for example, in grade three, to eight in ELA, uh, what that essentially you know, will boil down to is that we are probably like in the top 3% there, which is a really nice statistic for us. Naturally, you know, we don't live and die by this data, but what we do use it for is to help us understand where we may need to grow, right, if we want to be um, as competitive as we always have been. This is just a niche rank ranking that helps us to see where we are in 2008, I'm sorry, 2020, so 2020 rankings, uh, we were ranked number two, the second best school district in all of Massachusetts, um, the second best place to teach in Massachusetts, and our teachers were ranked third in all of Massachusetts. So a little shout out to our teachers association there as well. And Hopkinton High School was ranked at number 14. Um, so this gets us into the operating budget request at this point in time. Um, this slide basically shows the salary increase of 7.6% and an expense increase of 1.4%. Uh, the initial ask was for a 9% increase, bringing us to 52377018 Ms. Rothermick, just to clarify, because for a second there, I, I our teachers aren't getting a 7% raise. It's just the ad increase in the number of um, personnel, staff, everybody we need. In our, yeah, just to clarify, because for a second I thought, you know. Yeah. No, that, right. what that means is, is yeah. They're not getting a 7 Were you going to send us a resume? <laughs> yeah, no. I know it was. That's correct. Um, as we always say in um, municipals, um, municipalities, um, schools are is service driven. Um, so the majority of any budget in a municipality is salary driven. So you can see salary is 80% of your budget. This is just a look at the entire budget by educational program. Um, so you can see regular education at 55.6% and student services at 21%. 
So that gets you to a, the largest piece of the, of the budget. And then, of course, you have those wraparound services. You have to have transportation. You have to maintain your buildings. You need to maintain the infrastructure for technology. Um, that rounds out the, the rest of the budget in much smaller percentages. And this is the look by cost center. These are the cost centers that would have come to the school committee in terms of presenting each individual budget. Uh, as you can see from this as well, the uh, elementary schools all roughly are around the same percentage of the budget um, in the 7 to 8% range. And then as students progress through into secondary education, the, the cost to educate a student um, uh, grows. So in the middle, le middle school level, it's at 13% of the total budget. And at the high school level, it's at 18.4%. And again, you can see on the left side those smaller um, pieces, with the exception of student services, um, that are the, the wraparound and the, the maintenance of, of, the, of the district. So salaries, this gets into what you were speaking about in terms of contractual obligations, uh, is 4.7% of the increase, and staff requests represent 4.8%. And this outlines the staff requests that came from all the various cost centers, classroom teaching at 13.5, FTEs, which really um, all, while all of these really do speak to the growth of the district, uh, you can see where the classroom teaching um, piece is, is the greatest. Student services following on next, and then administrative and social emotional. The rest are really spread among different departments. Support that uh, is, you know, a point two here, point five there. Building and grounds is really to get our. Um, square footage per custodian down to what we consider to be a, a standard level um, in terms of the ability to clean a certain amount of square <coughs> footage. And so that was the request for the three FTEs for the custodians. And the technology, the webmaster, we um, invested a significant amount of money into a new website. And this would keep that website um, you know, content up to date and, you know, a return on our investment for what we did this year. Our expenses, um, the increase was 675000 which was a 6.9% increase. And again, this is just a look uh, by educational program. Um, you can see some of the, you know, what you would consider really a, a non-discretionary transportation uh, tuitions for out of district building and grounds and technology, which is your infrastructure. Those are really um, not discretionary expenses. So it really gets down to a very small percentage when you look at regular education and athletics in terms of what could be a potentially discretionary spending of that total $10 million. So the increases you see are outlined here. Transportation, the biggest piece is adding two more buses um, to accommodate growth. Technology, we spoke a little bit about accommodating um, the additional classrooms. However, there has been a change as requested by the school committee at the last meeting. So while it's not reflected here, we have reduced this amount and reduced the total budget by um, $61,000. Um, so we'll get back into that, but to present as it is here. Uh, building and grounds is to really get into having the operating budget um, start to carry those capital pro uh, capital replacements that are the less than $25,000. we have been able in the last two years to put those into a capital, but that really does not um, follow the guidelines of what is a capital request. Uh, so individual items that are less than 25000 really belong in the operating budget. Um, and student services on down, the rest of those are very small increases uh, really addressing student needs. 
Um, special education tuitions, you see, was a big swing um, in our favor, as well as vocational tuitions. So in just a quick update, um, by reducing that technology <coughs> and spreading out purchasing what needed to be purchased and then leasing what we could, we were able to reduce the budget by 60999 So that brought down the total budget request mark now to 52309719 which is 8.9% increase. Thank you, Ms. Rothamick, and especially for taking into consideration uh, what we discussed last week about technology. So if, uh, does anyone in the public have any questions, thoughts? Yes, please. Just to clarify what goes into uh, student services, please. Student services is special education, um, nursing, so all services that are for students that may be on IEPs, um, any type of specialized education that is maybe in addition to a regular classroom teacher. I noticed not only this budget, but the other budget, student services, by the number of added people is going up significantly. Significant. That's because correct. You teachers, you need to add support services. <coughs> right. So we may have a student that uh, comes to us that has a need for some type of um, paraprofessional support, if you will, and then depending on the level of support, um, you know, whether it would be a, a, a group support or a one-to-one -one support. So that's one level of staff requests. In addition, there um, just the growth in the students that are here, we have um, classrooms that service um, moderate needs that would maybe be either outside of the classroom or a teacher pushed into the classroom and then more intensive needs and so those classroom areas have also increased in growth and so teachers have been requested to address those students. I did have, I did have one other question. Do you have a, any data on percentage of the town budget represented by the school budget? I know that's probably growing over time. Uh, actually, as a percentage, we have actually stayed the same. So this the budget, budget is increasing the same ratio as the general increase in the town. It, up until this budget is potential. So I can perhaps um, give Great. something. We, ha uh, we were the growth study committee uh, working group this morning. Um, and one of the things that was brought up, again, these are numbers shared by the growth study committee, was uh, <coughs> overall the town budget is about 90 million and the schools were 49. So um, about 55 percent right. ish. And it has hung steady in that range, plus or minus a percentage or two over the last eight to 10 years, I think. I can't remember how far back we went, but it was something like that, eight to 10 years. Thank you. Right. Right. Uh, may I also request if members could come up to the mic? It might help our audience uh, at home who are watching to hear that. Um, so you had a question with regard to the increase on the town side. Uh, I think, uh, Ms. Rothamick, there were some details, right, that were shared on the town side. We just had some updates earlier this week uh, from our town manager. Um, hold one moment. So the, the short answer to the um, growth of revenue is no. Um, so the, the growth of revenue um, is not going to keep pace with what um, the school department is, is looking for. So the growth of revenue is um, in a couple of different buckets. You have the, the 2.5 um, tax levy that you can do, and then what is um, new growth, which is the any new buildings in town. So the 2.5 um, tax levy gets you 1.7 million, and new growth is estimated at around 2 million. So the request that the schools have put forward is more than the town revenue. 
So when you fold us in with all the other department requests, um, the difficulty and, and the update to the select board um, Tuesday, I believe, we have a structural deficit. Um, so the town departments have a structural deficit with their requests, and we have a, the school department, of course, being the largest department, has the largest structural deficit in terms of what can fit within the confines of Prop 2.5 and, and new growth. So it's an issue. Well, of course, uh, the exact details, you know, are best given by our town manager and that department. But based on what they had shared, we are at 96.5 million based on the Tuesday numbers that were shared of all the total sources of funds. Please. Would you like to come up? I would like to, but... <laughs> <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, just uh, on the presentation slides, um, the last few pie charts were those um, talking about the breakdown of the percent increase or decrease, whereas earlier in the deck was the net total amounts. For example, there was one slide earlier where I thought transportation was kind of small. Maybe that's the transportation expense percent of the overall budget, whereas that's later correct. you're talking about transportation's role as part of the increase of within, overall. Within just, so you have... The first couple were the percentage to the entire budget. Okay. And then when you saw transportation again, it was the percentage just to expenses. Okay. So that was moving salaries out of that pie chart altogether. Okay. So that second viewing where it showed transportation around 30%, uh, 28 or something, mm -hmm. that would be a clue to what's driving the, 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 the increase ask, right? Right. Okay. Right. So when you look at... Um, you know, the slide that shows just with expenses in terms of where we're really being driven, transportation is, is our biggest driver in, in the wrong direction. And the biggest piece of that is adding two buses. Right. Um, and that's really just growth. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions, talks? Yes, please. So uh, I'm Sam Dokovich, 8 Erica Drive. So my question is not so much about next year's budget, but for long-term planning. Because I would, when you had your figures, you said in the 2021 year you had 4411 projected students. Then by the end of the decade, it was 4856, which is another 18% increase. So I think one of the issues that townspeople struggle with is this budget is a big increase, but you're going to be coming back for more increases. and if the population or the school population growth continues, you're going to need more classrooms. That may shift yes. because maybe the, you won't, the kindergarten and smaller grades will not, lower grades will not be growing, but the upper grades will be growing as that bubble moves through the school system. So that's just a concern. I know it's outside the scope of this meeting, but that long-term 18% growth over the decade needs to be discussed and addressed somehow. Absolutely. Yeah. Your, your thoughts are much appreciated. And if I might just say that, you know, um, we did our special town meeting and some of the measures we are taking uh, with regard to the high school addition as mm -hmm. well as... Yeah, I, pr I was at that meeting, right. so it was so, a good presentation. So that was... At the, at the end when everyone was very tired, so it was very good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but certainly more work is upcoming. Uh, you know, we just went through the MSBA site visit. They came and had a look at... Um, uh, what are our needs and how much they are able to fund. So there's more work to be done there. Uh, we have representation on the overall town growth study committee where we're working with them closely, both in terms of uh, a member from our committee partnering there as well as them working very closely with the school department. So this is, uh, this is a time of change, but we are all working hard keeping the long term in mind. Uh, and I don't know if any member would like to add more. One other thing that we're looking at with the growth study committee too, to speak to your point about how the, you know, are, is this a bubble or is this going to be something Continue. that we're looking at? Exactly, exactly. Um, so we're looking at home turnover sales and how, you know, it's it's a really tricky thing to track if a home sells, whether or not there's school children that move into that home until those school children regis register for school. So um, that's one of the things that the committee has actually been trying to figure out: is there a way that we can guess? 
or at least make an educated guess based on folks moving into town. Um, but when we have all of these three and four bedroom homes being constructed, the kids may move through school and graduate, but we also, through the Growth Study Committee, have found that a lot of folks tend to stay in town until their kids move through the school system and then tend to move out of town and then new families move into town into those three and four bedroom homes. And so the cycle seems to continue. So you're, I mean, we have, you know, we have no crystal ball. You're right, we, it could very well be a bubble. But it seems like there's been um, sort of a 60-40 contribution of new construction versus home sale turnover in terms of the addition to, of the number of students in the schools. So um, if, if construction starts to slow down, It'll be good for the schools, but it's tricky for the town because we're relying on mm -hmm. that new growth revenue as part of our budget, budgeting process for the last several years. So there's this careful balance that everyone's trying to strike. And I think, you know, you're right. People need to be asking these hard questions because there's no one has an answer yet. Well, and as was already mentioned, if the school budget keeps growing and overall revenue's not growing, right. then we what have happens? a major problem yep. Yep. because you have a structural gap in your budgeting process. Yep. Exactly. And you got to look for other sources of... Revenue, you can't base it just on residential taxes. We have to look at expanding our commercial base so we can get more you, taxes. You on should that come side. to the growth study. This is exactly <laughs> what we're talking about. But it is a, a big conversation about how, how small our commercial, um, commercial taxes are in terms of the whole sort of tax income in the, or you know revenue in the in the town. Um, and again, you know, you got to attract the companies. But how do you attract the companies? You attract them with tax breaks and so it's this whole cycle of um, but it's a, it's a good discussion and there's some pretty um, people way smarter than me on that committee trying to figure it all out so I think yeah it's a well, it's good, good to hear there's focus people on are working that because that's the long term yeah. solution to this 18% growth exactly yep. so okay thank you very much thank you and I believe if you go back to a master plan that was done for the town years ago it speaks in that master plan to the need uh, long before this ever became a problem to the need of growing the commercial base yeah. um, to, mm -hmm. you know, lessen the burden of this on taxpayers. Yeah. I would also recommend reaching out to the chair of the Town Growth Study Committee, Amy Ritterbush. I think they have captured a ton of data, a lot of which was presented. We have all participated um, in the growth study uh, public hearing and public participation workshops that they have had. So 84% of our um, tax base is coming from personal property taxes. Um, and they actually provided some comparison with other surrounding districts. So that's also an interesting aspect. I also think one of their suggestions, which I personally am a supporter of, is getting someone to uh, focus on bringing more businesses into town. The, uh, I forget Economic what the title is. officer. Yes. Yep. Um, they talked about the fact that this has been done in Ashland and how can we uh, get someone to do this in a manner that um, it's self-paying, if you will, uh, that there are incentives tied to the work that's done. Um, it's all interconnected. We understand some of these questions are not necessarily under our purview, right, right. but we are all trying to work with all our partners. And for whatever it's worth, there's language being developed right now to put that on town meeting, or an article on town meeting for the economic development officer. So it hasn't been approved or presented to the select board yet, but they're putting it together, trying to make it happen. Yep. Any other questions from members? Great. Uh, any other thoughts from our school committee members here? So I, I had a couple of things I just want to throw out, and if you don't have the numbers, because I did not provide the questions in advance, I know we're going to come back and discuss this as a committee again next week. But I, it, there's been a lot of talk about the number of special educators um, that we have the need for in our district, and I'm just wondering if you have, I know you have them, but I don't know if you have them available, any numbers on how the caseloads of our special educators compare with other districts, are we, with the increases that are being proposed for next year, will that leave us in a place where our students with special needs have adequate, um, we're not overtaxing, I guess, where, where things are? No, so based on the students who are enrolled in the Hopkinton Public Schools today, one of the things that we had looked at, uh, for example, with the middle school, um, there's a big question at the middle school, will we need another intensive special needs teacher or will we stick with the 
one intensive needs teacher and the current number of moderate um, needs teachers that we have there. Currently, middle school caseloads are about nine or 10. And uh, in the budgeting process, it's really important for people to understand that when we do this, we don't pull sort of numbers out of the air. You know, we really seek out data. So I had asked uh, Mr. Keller to reach out to schools similar to our own, high performing districts, and ask what their middle school moderate special educator caseloads looked like. And the information that he brought back was that most districts are somewhere around 14 to 18 on average 16. So with with caseloads of 9 and 10, our special educators have a lot of opportunity to really interact and give kids exceedingly good service. In class, the other question I had, and I know that we had discussed this as a group earlier on in the budgeting process, but there, I have heard this out in the community, is uh, kind of looking at where our class sizes are, uh, in particular at the middle school. I don't need the exact show numbers. you some slides? I did not know you had the slides available. Oh, some slides. That would be great. Thank you. Okay. I'll just very quickly run through some of these. And I, I know people have wondered what do our um, class sizes look like. And so in order to be able to give people sort of actual data, one of the things that I was able to do is just take screenshots out of PowerSchool. So PowerSchool is the um, online vessel that we use to do all of our scheduling, to store all of our student data. Um, so if you take a look at this grade one teacher's schedule, you can see that she has 23 students in her classroom. And right now, our grade one classrooms are 22, 23, 24. And I really think 23 and 24, that's way too many students to have in a grade one classroom. Those classrooms should be at like 18 and 19. So these are very, very big class sizes. Uh, here's grade two. Those were all at 22. And these are actual, just sort of a sample. It doesn't let you know who the teacher is. Um, here's a grade three teacher's schedule. There are 24 kids in all of those classes. Again, too many. Here's grade four. Uh, we have 24 kids. And you'll know that Hopkins, I think, probably has the largest class sizes at 24 and 25. There's a fifth grade teacher who has sort of that combination of 24 and 25. Here's a grade six English teacher who has, um, and, and this I think is what people will often speak to. When you start getting into the secondary level, the class size is vary, right? Because um, students have different needs, students have different homerooms, and students you know, travel to different math classes. So you, you get this sort of imbalance. Um, so this particular teacher can have a class size of 17 during one period, and then two periods where that person has 24 kids in a classroom. Can I just ask a, interrupt sure. you? Sorry. Yeah. But, so in looking at the, the 24 versus the 16, is that a scheduling issue with other classes that students in there have, or is that a purposeful issue because we have kids with more needs in the class with 16 or something of that nature? It can be either one of those things. Sometimes you have students who are going to a particular math class, so you know it will impact what happens when they go to an English class or a social studies class. And Dr. Kavner, um, you know, we had heard a little bit about the needs aspect, right? Mm -hmm. So are, are you able to indicate a little bit how many of these kids have certain needs which require uh, the classroom sizes to remain smaller? Is there any indication that you're able to share? I, I would be hesitant to do that right now because, you know, just in choosing a, a grade six English teacher, for example, I didn't look at, like, you know, the, the makeup of that person's classes and, and why one would be smaller, one would be larger. Um, I can offer you a little bit of anecdotal evidence. So one of the things that has happened with sixth grade, we now do a double literacy block. 
And what's been really nice about that is there are some times in that double literacy block where you know, you'll have a, a sixth grade teacher and then you'll also have an opportunity to have a push in special educator and also a, um, a reading specialist. So, you know, it, I, I think our kids are, are getting good services in sixth grade with that double literacy block. That was one of the things that Mr. Keller had asked for in the last bu round of budget, and I think that it, it's certainly answering a, stu a, a need for our kids. And I think, too, the piece, you know, that you've said so well over the last several meetings, too, is that we've managed it, and the teachers are managing it, yes. and they're handling it. Um, but when you look at, for example, this teacher, she, this teacher has 86 English students mm -hmm. spaced out over four classes, which, so if she assigns or he assigns an essay, has to grade 86 essays and if, give effective feedback to 86 mm -hmm. kids. And I, I'm only saying this because I actually taught grade six English. That's starting to push it <laughs> a little bit. Like your, your feedback on essay number one is markedly different than your feedback on essay number 86. So I, you know, the teachers are handling it, and this is doable. But as we look at those projections over the next several years, if you're going to add another 20 kids to this teacher's caseload, if you yes. want to call it that, without increasing the number of faculty, then that teacher's going to lose her or his mind trying these, to grade 100 essays. The assignments will change. Oh, I mean, or the assignments will change, the right, exactly. Change so, right, it's just, I mean, and, and for all of the upper level teachers, as much as for the younger level teachers where they're in a room with the same 24 kids or 25 kids, which is in and of itself, you know, they're handling it, but it's a challenge. When you have to grade 100 assignments versus 85 assignments, there's a tipping point in there somewhere where yes. you can't give good feedback unless, like you said, you ch either change the way you teach or the way you assess or, or something has to give, so. And I think in addition to the assessment piece, the instruction, you know, is compromised mm -hmm. as well because a teacher has less time to get to every student. Right. Uh, I know uh, one of the questions that came up, uh, so here's an eighth grade one. And again, you can sort of see that, you know, the numbers are kind of all over the place. So you can have a class that has 13, but you'll also have a class that has 19. And this one, I think, is, is interesting, too, because it shows you that, yes, this is a teacher who is teaching one period a day outside of the area of certification. So four English classes and then a, a civics class. Although well, civics is a new unit to the middle school in general anyway, because it's just been mandated. So teachers have been trained for that. Recently, right? Recently, yeah. very recently, yes. And then finally, here's physical <coughs> education. So you can take a look at that and see that you have a class of 21, 23, 22, but then you also have some very high classes there when you're starting to push 27 and 29, you know, in, in a PE wellness class, um, physical education class at the middle school level. And are these, no, it looked like those class sizes in the other grades were from 1920. Are they, does the 2021 budget support similar class sizes or does it allow for any shifts in class sizes? So I think that if we look at the way um, Mr. Keller has made requests for mm -hmm. FTEs and the way that we have kept them in the budget, I think that we can maintain class sizes like this, unless there are, you know, you remember we had the year where there were great big surprises, where we were adding 25 students to a particular grade level. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, I, I'm confident that the class sizes will be fine. Once again, though, as uh, Mrs. Abate said last week, uh, we will have a couple of people who are teaching outside of their area of certification. So a science teacher may need to teach a section of math, or a math teacher may need to teach a section of science. And, and I think that's really being fiscally responsible while we are also doing the very best we can to address student needs. Any other questions? Thoughts? Okay. Saying none, I'd like um, us uh, to propose that we close the public hearing section of our meeting. Do I need a motion? So moved. Okay. Second. All right. Give Motion it to Amanda. By Nancy, second by Amanda. All those in favor? Yes. yes. I'm a yes as well. So that carries. Moving on to the next item on the agenda. And, and members of the public are welcome to stay. Uh, we have interesting aspects coming up. 
I was just going to add, we will be voting on this um, next week, correct? That, that is that correct. Should, that and is and correct. any changes that we choose to, to entertain at that time. Absolutely. Thank you for that reminder, Nancy. So our vote on the budget will be on the 16th. Um, also, between now and then, I know we haven't had a lot of participation uh, in person here tonight, but folks uh, watching at home, they're welcome to send us an email or uh, find us somewhere, uh, you know, in town. Don't hesitate to ask us a question. I'd also just add that um, if you walk away and you wonder, you want to know more about the student services budget or whatever, if you go to the website under the school committee, all the budget documents are there, so you can read them over, and then if you have another detailed question, forward it on to us from there, so. Thank you again. Um, did you, it seem like you had something else? Nope, that's yeah, it. Good, all right. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to the next item on the agenda, recognitions. Um, does anyone have a recognition? Uh, I have one um, today. I had the opportunity to go to the RAD um, session, oh, the yeah. workshop. Um, I, this was my second year going for that. I thought it was okay. fabulous. Uh, I think it takes a lot of courage from the young girls, and I hear it's been ex the program has been extended to boys as well to do that kind of training. And I'm very uh, a big shout out to uh, Mr. Nod, as well as all the members who made that program possible all the students who participated in it, as well as the volunteers uh, who were willing to get kicked. Uh, and um, so that wasn't easy. Um, so that's a great program, right? Moving on to the next item on the agenda, public comments. Okay, any comments, any further comments? Great, thank you. So we'll move right into the next item on the agenda, uh, into reports. We don't have student council tonight, um, Dr. Kavner, so we'll move straight to your report, the superintendent's report. Okay, so my report this evening uh, begins the discussion around my formative or mid-year evaluation, and then I always have my section on uh, happenings in our schools. So, <sighs> Every superintendent would have a mid-cycle formative assessment. Um, mine is done on a yearly basis, so at the mid-year, we look at the formative assessment. And if people are wondering what that comprises, typically the evaluation of a superintendent is not dissimilar from that of a principal or a teacher. Um, the superintendent establishes goals, which we had done last summer. So with the school committee, we form and agree upon uh, the superintendent's goals. And over time, I continue to uh, pursue those goals. And we kind of keep track of those things um, in a time-sensitive way, ensuring that all of the key actions and the benchmarks are carried out. Uh, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education also has a rubric and they are in the process of transitioning from a rubric that had uh, standards and indicators and elements to one that stops at the indicator level. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. And then the third piece for the superintendent's assessment is always public understanding. And so what should happen is that the superintendent's evaluation is done in public and the school committee will review either the summative or the formative report and the evidence um, at a public meeting, which is what's happening right now. <laughs> So what kinds of things can be categorized as evidence for your formative mid-year evaluation? And these just came right from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education uh, website. So a lot of the things on this list I know that you see simply because of your role and my role. So things like our agenda, the reports that we give, minutes of our meeting, those things can be evidence for the superintendent. Uh, observation of the superintendent in action at school committee meetings, in forums with parents, at meetings with municipal officials, and uh, at community events. Uh, any kind of student outcome data that comes to us from statewide uh, testing, for example, MCAS, common assessments that are given in our building, uh, any of the things that are sort of nationally normed. We use star reading data. We use star math data. Our students are always taking the benchmark assessment system from Fountas and Pinnell. There's QRI data. So we have an awful lot of data. Uh, one of the things that we do is we keep all of this data and then we have individual meetings with teachers and I really must say I am proud of the data that the principals in this district have. They are unlike a lot of uh, other building principals and I think that that's one of the reasons for our very high performance is that we are constantly monitoring where kids are. 
Uh, other evidence, budget presentations and reports, any samples of newsletters, any local media presentation, um, you know, blogs, emails, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, district and school improvement plans, the hiring of teachers, how we retain our teachers, do we keep track of those sorts of things. Uh, the superintendent's analysis of professional practice and student learning goals, which you'll see tonight. The superintendent's reflection on staff feedback, samples of leadership team agendas, and the leadership team means twice monthly for two hours, and uh, any kind of reports about student or staff performance. And those are just suggestions. There's all kinds of other things that we could use uh, as evidence. So what were my goals? Uh, my first one was to conduct an analysis of the school facilities and develop a capital budget that reflected the perceived needs of our schools. So I've highlighted some of the big aspects of that to monitor student enrollment. You know that I do that at every single school committee meeting. We keep very close watch on that. Um, by December 31st, 2019, in collaboration with the Director of Building and Grounds and um, community donors, we completed the sort of no-cost uh, interior renovation to the White House, and you'll remember that on December 5th, we had a really nice open house over there, and I think the kids were quite proud of their space. By January 31st, we will seek capital funding for any recommended building addition or renovation projects. Uh, when I set that goal, we had no idea that there would be a special town meeting on December 9th, so uh, we are quite pleased with the results of special town meeting. And is it February 3rd that there will be the town-wide vote right. to approve the Elmwood and Hopkins additions? Um, I agreed to work with the Director of Finance, the Director of Building and Grounds, and an architectural firm to determine costs to, to, cost to add classrooms to Hopkinton High School. Uh, we had some rough numbers, as you know, and now we're going to be putting that out so that we can get um, engineering and design work done so that we have hard and fast numbers. Um, and then during the budget process, present a capital plan that reflects the needs of the school's physical plants, and Mrs. Rothermick and I have submitted that um, to the town. My second goal was sort of grassroots methods to build the repertoires of administrators, faculty, and staff with the hope of ensuring greater social and psychological safety for all of our kids. Uh, so uh, by September 1st, to assemble the school committee's district subcommittee for the calendar revision, uh, that committee met from, oh, the summertime until just recently, and we have made a recommendation, and I think that that will be on next week's agenda. On August 28th, address the entire school district. So all of our faculty does come together at the beginning of school. And the message was really to get to know every student. Again, every student a study of one. And a lot of the information that was given to uh, our faculty came from Cornelius Minor and um, Adolph Brown. And the next bullet down indicates that uh, the admin team has been sort of working with the We've Got This, Equity Access, and the Quest to Be Who Our Students Need Us to Be, the Cornelius Minor book. Um, Mrs. Parson did a really nice job presenting something to our admin team just this week. Um, sending educative emails to all staff. I will openly admit that that is not done. Mm -hmm. uh, occasionally using the superintendent's blog to promote learning around diversity, sensitivity, equity, and inclusivity. Um, there has been limited progress there. We have not yet had our visions training, but I January know that's- January 25th. January 25th, it's going to happen. Uh, by September 1st, assemble the school committee's district subcommittee for calendar, oops, did I put that one in there twice? I did, oops, that one is done. And with the assistant superintendent, begin the process of interrogating the curriculum to ensure its responsiveness to sensitivity for all students, and there has been some progress there. The third goal, goal was to grow communication between families and the superintendent and grow relationships with our elected officials. Uh, Mrs. Rothermick and I do meet with the town manager and the town CFO all the time. I meet fairly regularly with the uh, town librarian, the head of the library. Uh, there are what we call you know, senior meetings, and so all of the town departments get together. Tomorrow morning we have a safety meeting, so the fire chief and the police chief and several of the officers will be there, as well as the deputy fire chief. So we continue to work on that. Um, 
But the aspects of that goal were to uh, complete a weekly superintendent's blog on the new website. I have not done that weekly. I have a few backed up that will be going out and that will be addressing, I think, that how are we going to be able to handle growth in the future? So I think that, that the question that was asked tonight is a pertinent one. Uh, and that's sort of going out as like a five-part series. Uh, to use email effectively as a medium for school business communications. Before all of our meetings now, I've been sending something home to families so they have a sense that we will be meeting. And I think it has actually increased awareness of what's on our agenda. I try to put out the salient points. Uh, to use HCAM as a medium to share information with the community and with families. Uh, I think I've made some good progress there. Not only do I have that regular show called Highlights from the Hill, but we, I have also been doing sort of snippets throughout the budget season and um, I don't remember if it was Monday or Tuesday. I just, you know, sort of filmed another one about this budget and encouraged people to come out tonight. Um, to foster transparency, sincerity, and frequent communication through the operating and capital budgeting process. And I think we've tried to do that with all the presentations that uh, we have made here. And by June of 2020, produced seven to nine HCAM television broadcasts. I think I may actually be over seven to nine now. Maybe it's like 17 now. Regular star now. Yeah. <laughs> star of film and stage. All right, and then finally, my fourth goal was to launch initiatives that build innovative learning opportunities for students. Uh, we do have a STEAM coordinator. That position is funded through a state grant, which has been wonderful. Um, Mrs. Lechjansky is working on getting internships together for February vacation. And I think she has reached out to many, many businesses in the community, and she's having meetings with each individual employer so that you know we know where our kids are going. Uh, through tech, engage at least two teachers in the FUSE Fellowship Program to promote more personalized learning in the district. Um, that's ongoing. Uh, that has really largely been the work of Mr. Ghosh and Mrs. Parson and our building principals, Mr. Keller and Mr. Uh, Bishop. By March 1st, work with the building principals, the director of student services to conduct a full special education audit of Marathon and Elmwood. Uh, we are really working um, exclusively right now with Marathon. You know we had done some of that work with Elmwood last spring and Mrs. Parson and uh, Dr. Zaleski are working now to bring Landmark in to do some more training with our special educators in those buildings. So we're kind of excited about that work. Starting in September, we'll work with the assistant superintendent to contract with a professional development pro provider to bring guided inquiry into the district. Uh, that was done back in November. Uh, we trained grades four to eight. We did not train grade three, but we did bring in the high school. So uh, some shifts, I think, in our thinking happened after these goals were established. And then starting in September, working with the assistant superintendent and secondary principals to increase social emotional learning and behavioral programs. Uh, try to get more student voice and choice opportunities and I think we've done quite a bit of that. I think when we even think about the grade six literacy, when you walk around the classrooms, kids are all sort of choosing their own books to read and interacting with adults and having conversations about what they're reading in addition to being able to, you know, have some CVTE uh, options, some STEM options. So there's a lot more choice, I think, in, in our schools. So those were the four goals, and I think that's kind of an update on the progress of where I am with them. And what I've done here is to simply put in um, the standards so that you can, uh, the uh, indicators under each standard, I should say, for each of the four standards. So the first one is instructional leadership. You can see they address um, curriculum, instruction, assessment, the evaluation of our principals and teachers, uh, using data to um, make good decisions, and then finally measuring student learning. And I think that we do that exceedingly well, and it drives instruction, and it drives the budget for the following year. So if there are anything in these uh, indicators that you, know, you would like for me to present sort of 
individual pieces of evidence, I am happy to do that. If you would like to choose particular indicators and say these are the ones that we really, really want you to work on between now and the summative evaluation, DESE is looking for districts to decide if they would like to pilot this, and that's obviously a decision uh, to make uh, collaboratively, but I really like DESE's idea of using the indicator as opposed to Know, some crazy number of, of elements because I think the element, elements inform the indicators, but they can get muddy. Uh, and we can talk more about this next week. I know that, Mrs. Fargiano, you have done a lot of work kind of following how DESE has been working with superintendents to evaluate them. Standard two is management and operations. Uh, do we uh, have a school environment where children are safe, where they are, their health is protected, they are, their emotional and social needs are being met. Do we have a human resources um, department that is implementing a cohesive approach to recruiting, hiring, induction, development, and career growth? Um, uh, is our scheduling and management system um, up to par? And I would say that the answer to that is a resounding yes. The people who work in Mr. Ghosh's department and do student uh, management are phenomenal. Um, am I aware of the laws that uh, surround um, the governing of schools and ethics and policies, and do we follow those? And are we maintaining sound fiscal systems as a school district? Standard three is family and community engagement. And the four indicators under that standard are um, ensuring that all families feel welcome in our schools and in our classrooms, um, and that families feel like they can contribute to the effectiveness of the classroom or to the school or to the district or to the community. Um, do we share responsibility with families and community stakeholders so that um, learning at home and at school are sort of um, articulated back and forth? Uh, do we engage in regular two-way culturally proficient communication with families and with community stakeholders? And um, do we address family and community concerns in an equitable, effective, and efficient manner? And then the last one is standard four, professional culture. Uh, are we a district that is committed to high standards? Uh, do we have cultural proficiency? Um, do we have, does the superintendent have strong interpersonal written and verbal communication skills? Is the superintendent committed to continuous learning? Uh, do we have a shared vision? Are we successfully and continuously engage all stakeholders in the creation of a shared educational vision in which each student is prepared to succeed in post-secondary education and become a responsible citizen and global contributor? And finally, does the superintendent manage conflict well? So those are all of the indicators under those four standards. And again, I am very happy to do whatever it is that the committee would like to kind of address the shift in superintendent evaluation. Can I ask a quick question about Of course, year, I'm year, happy to take any feedback. Just a just question, um, year two, so year one, I know you worked closely with your mentor and you had training. Yes. Does that continue this year or it, what, what support system do you have behind you in the superintendent world. It does. The new superintendent induction program, which we refer to as NISIP, is a three-year program. Okay. So last year, as a first-year superintendent, they sort of walk you through how to do, you know, the entry findings, the district strategy. It's, I, I can't say enough good about the program. It really does guide you to, you know, all of the things that will make a superintendent successful, I think. Um, and you get a mentor, and all of the first-year superintendents meet every month in the first year. This year, you meet every other month. So for example, today I had a, a NISIP meeting. Uh, my cohort of superintendents had over 40 people starting all together. Uh, they had invited me yesterday morning to speak to the current year ones, and um, there are only 19 in that cohort. So it's just an anomalous year, obviously, with my group. But what's very nice about it is with that many superintendents from that many districts across Massachusetts, there's like a lot of sort of give and take. You know, we learn a lot from each other. 40 out of, aren't there fewer than 400 districts in the state? Yeah, there are 351 yeah. cities and towns, and I think if we went back to the slide that sort of showed our rankings, depending on, you know, schools, it can be 350 elementary schools, but 260 high schools or something, so. So greater than 10% of the state's superintendents turned over last year. Absolutely, 
Yeah. Now, um, when you form this new cohort, mm -hmm. are these all brand new to superintendency or brand new to superintendency in that particular district? Most of them are the former. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Because some superintendents, correct me if I'm wrong, but some districts maybe don't opt to have the superintendent participate in the NISA program. Is that, that is true. There could be districts that had new superintendents that don't. Uh, because the group meets in Marlboro, I mean, we have some people who come from so far out in the western part mm -hmm. of the state that they literally drive two hours to get mm -hmm. to that program. Wow. Mm -hmm. It seems like a very good program, though. It's a very good program, yeah. So we're looking for some feedback. Do, do you remember? I was just going to ask feedback? if you Questions. you mentioned how, you know how to tackle it, um, and you went to the the yeah. presentation, so maybe you can speak better to this. But I, I definitely think that sticking to these indicators. How many elements are there? Like fifty, hundred. There's a lot. Yeah, I think that so right sticking to these is probably twenty one yeah. indicators. Yeah. So there may be two and three elements under each per one. indicator. Yes. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So I feel like there's there's no need to go that that deeply. I don't think we see your work daily. You know, so it's on the agenda for next week. Oh, it is. Um, okay. Yeah, but just Good. you know, a little teaser. They are um, piloting a new, as you said, a new approach, a new rubric, which stops at the indicator level, but also. Um, for each um, rating level for that indicator, they're trying to actually focus on um, ratings that stick to the school committee's purview of sort of management. Oh. There's rewording. <coughs> what they found was that at the element level, it got very operational, mm -hmm. and it kind of crossed a lot of lines and, and made for difficulty in school committee and superintendents getting this review done at the right level in the right way. So <laughs> the pilot, um, and we are totally we can talk about this next week, but we can sign up to participate. Um, they just want to track which districts are trying it out. The pilot uses these new definitions to kind of fit their relationship better and then um, stop at this indicator level. So okay. it seems like they're trying to make it make more week. sense. I think it was more, it more emulated the teacher evaluation before at the element level. It, from what mm -hmm. I was reading, it's in, and they're really trying to make it unique to the school committee superintendent relationship and oversight. So that's great. Look forward to that. Mm -hmm. The quick question on some of the because you had a lot of evidence that you were looking at in terms of that, on that first slide. The staff feedback is that something that you get? Is that formal or informal feedback that you're? So that's an interesting thing. Uh, one of the things about feedback. Um, and I don't think that we ever negotiated it with our teachers association, but when they change the educator evaluation model, whether it's for our teachers or principals or superintendents, one of the pieces in there is to get some kind of feedback. I will typically ask um, the admin council folks, so that's all the central office administrators in the building, just for, you know, feedback sometimes on, you know, after we've had an admin council meeting, but I don't think that I have ever sort of put out that formal, you know, does every teacher in the district want to evaluate the superintendent? Right. I, I think that would be uh, not easy, I would imagine. <laughs> um, uh, you know, again, there is something that I had uh, worked on in my corporate career, uh, which was a more 360 degree review, where you can um, select a few people uh, working with your manager so that you're not just picking people who will give you great responses but work with this uh, your manager to select a group of people mm -hmm. whose feedback uh, is equitable right right is, and it's reflective so you can look at your clients you can look at uh, you know your peers your reports um, community members of course your managers so. Yeah, that was a, I always love the 360 degree review. I, th I think it gives you a really good picture of how you're doing uh, yeah. from everyone. Okay. I have, um, you know, some um, thoughts that Professor Tyler shared. They oh. just came in. Uh, you know, she's away and traveling, uh, as most of us know. You failed to take us with her. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so she shared some thoughts and questions. So I'll just share those sure. with you. 
Um, she says, Dr. Kavanaugh works tirelessly and selflessly for the district. She also retains her equanimity in times of crisis. She's an adept administrator. It is no small accomplishment to have put in place such a strong administrative team. The commitment and shared goals of district leaders can only enhance the educational experience for our students. She goes on to ask a question about goal two, and I'm not quite sure if you have all of this information right away. Um, I just received it just before the meeting as well. So for goal two, she's asking, could you say something about what kind of progress has been made on interrogating the curriculum to ensure its responsiveness to sensitivity for all students? Yeah, so um, for that particular question, I'm not exactly sure that I would say interrogating the curriculum, but I would say interrogating the delivery of curriculum. Because one of the things that we have been looking at, um, DESI will give us information that helps us to understand where things might not be equitable, right? So. Um, Recently, Mrs. Parson and I had been looking at, um, this is kind of interesting, so you get a scatter plot, and the scatter plot will show you in the y-axis uh, the student achievement on MCAS, and on the x-axis it will show you the growth. So what you would really hope is that all of your kids are clustered in that upper right-hand corner so that we know that they're growing markedly and achieving markedly. But one of the things that we started to see, um, and I won't share with great, what grade level this is, um, but one of the things that we started to see was that our highest flyers, the kids who were achieving at the top of that, had also made significant growth. And this isn't every single dot on the scatter plot, but you see a whole lot of blue clustered in the upper right-hand corner. But as we started to take a look at um, the kids who were not our highest achievers, so their achievement level was um, partially meeting expectations, for example, under that, that MCAS label, uh, a lot of those kids had made less growth. And the yellow dots were all sort of clustered over on the left-hand side next to the y-axis. So as we look at the kinds of instruction that those kids are getting, now our question is not so much about the curriculum, but sort of the curriculum and its implementation and the instruction. Are we, mm -hmm. you know, in somehow in our educators' minds, are we thinking that, you know, maybe those kids are kids who, you know, aren't ready for this yet. But in reality, I think that there are things that they are ready for. And I think that we have to start thinking about sort of those levels of challenge and, and pushing them a little bit further. One of the things that we know about, and I would love to show you this, um, but it, it would be, I don't know. Uh, but the when we started to have SGP scores or just go through growth percentile scores, and this happened probably 10 years ago, it was the MTA who put out a very phenomenal video that takes about four minutes that explains how SGP works. So if all of us had the exact same MCAS profile from the beginning of time, we got a 240, a 244, a 248, a 252. We all had the exact same scores. We become, across Massachusetts, so we could all live in different districts, we become a, a cohort of MCAS students. So the next time we take the test, if Amanda gets 250 and Jen gets 248, Nancy gets 246, they just rank order us. So imagining that there would be 10, there'd be somebody who was in the 99th percentile, the 90th, the 80th, the 70th. So the kids who are our kids, who are in that yellow cluster, it's, it's not as if we're comparing them against each other, but we are comparing them against other <coughs> students with the exact same MCAS profile across the state. And we are the Hopkins <coughs> Public Schools. Our kids should be leading the path there. So that's an example of the kind of work that we have been doing. It's been a lot of work, I think, that has been more about um, equity around instruction. So, uh, no, I'm that's not. where our interests have driven us, I think, in an organic way. Could it also be some of the work that um, you and um, Jen Parsons have done just as far as changing the books the kids have access, something as simple as that. Oh my goodness, the, the, yes. The change and sort of the focus of some of the literature and, the, and all the schools has gotten sort of away from, you know, a pretty homogenous demographic and now there's more um, diversity in the books, right? And in yes. the materials. Uh, you should see the books that our elementary librarians have been purchasing. I mean, some really nice, not only diversity texts, but also um, 
some really nice science texts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In social studies, and yeah. There's also a question from her on goal number four. Um, no doubt the booming enrollment numbers are the culprit here. But could she speak to why there has been no progress made on the special education audit for Elmwood? Where does she discern room for improvement? Okay, so the reason that we have not gone back to Elmwood, uh, we had the same consultant who's working at Marathon now work at Elmwood last year. And when these goals were written, we thought, well, maybe we would have her do sort of a really full audit. But as we are looking at Marathon and Elmwood, the information that we gleaned last year for Elmwood, we're very comfortable with now. And we've made that decision to just have her do the same sort of work at Marathon, because now what we've decided to do is just to take those two schools and bring in landmark um, and we're also doing a lot of uh, PBIS work which is a positive behavior system uh, we have RTI in those buildings and so I think that um, in terms of all of our kids we're kind of in a good place so we get to that place of now with looking very very specifically at the programs that we have there and she'll remember that we you know had trained a lot of people in specialized reading programs as well a couple of years ago so I mean, it's all part and parcel of that same movement, but after looking at the information we got from Marathon, we decided that the information we had from Elmwood was sufficient, really. And um, hopefully this is the last one, I'm not sure. Uh, and in the slide, evidence for formative mid-year evaluation, there is listed superintendent's reflection on staff feedback. For clarification, could she please give the community a sense of her take on the public commentary offered by the HTA last week? Sure. Well, you know, Mrs. Rothermick and I talked about that, um, and I think that one of the things that happens with budgeting is it gets really emotional. You know, I mean, we all have great passion for the work that we do. We have great passion for the kids who are sitting in front of us. And, you know, I think I had even said this in the uh, Metro West article, if money were not finite, we would be able to give kids everything. Do you know what I mean? But I think... Um, you know, when, when we talk about something like uh, hiring another social studies teacher so that people aren't teaching outside of their area of certification, if you were to do that, I mean, it would be wonderful because everybody would be on team and you would have that, you know, certified person standing in front of the kids. But at the end of the day, you know, you'd have class sizes that were probably at like 13. And I think that as a superintendent, people start to question your credibility when you're asking for an additional teacher, but it's going to reduce class size to like 13. You know what I mean? And it's really difficult. It's also my job to have the 30,000 foot view. So it's very difficult for me to say I'll commit to class sizes of 13 for social studies in the middle school when I'll have class sizes of 22 and 23 for fourth and fifth grade, right, where teachers are, are generalists. And, you know, I, you just have to make those decisions that are good for all buildings, all students, all administrators. Thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh. I don't know if Professor Tyler is watching this uh, from wherever she is, uh, but hopefully she'll catch it on, on tape later. Thank you. Um, I put together some thoughts as well, uh, very high level really, because I think there's so much uh, that goes on on a day-to-day -day basis uh, that you work on. Um, so in this big public enterprise that we are all a part of, uh, the taxpayers are the boss. And this board, their elected representatives, conducting this performance review is one of the three big responsibilities that have been entrusted on us. Uh, policy and budget being the other two. And like policy and budget, this is an ongoing process. Um, Dr. Kavanaugh, the work you do is very involved, and I see you work very, very hard every single day. There's no exception. I think you're on 24 by 7. Um, it is clear not just from the evidence you have shared, but even otherwise. Um, it is nice to get an opportunity to check in mid-year and share some thoughts. So today I want to call out one major accomplishment and one area of growth for your consideration. Um, to me, when I see all these details, these are great. These are ongoing work along with your team. The highlight of your work that I really want to call out is your work related to advocating for and presenting the space needs this year. This was not a task. Um, this was a task that you identified and took head on. 
and there were many intricacies which you worked through to bring it to light and make happen. Folks don't fully understand what are the kinds of things that have gone in, whether it's the verbiage of the motions that are being put for, the articles that are being put for. That's, that's just a small sampling. But also, just sharing all the numbers and the needs, um, it was a lot. So we're one step away from its completion. However, it's a huge win for our schools, thanks to your tireless work. Well, I also have to thank Mrs. Rothermick for work with on that was very tireless as well. We were um, a good team. So I'd like to congratulate you on thank that. You. Um, now for the growth area. Leaders are responsible for setting the culture in any enterprise. This is the true long range work of leadership. We have many stakeholders in a public school enterprise. Stakeholders bring different perspectives, be it teachers, students, parents, community members, town partners, or school committee members. My um, suggestion or for your consideration is to continue to work on creating an environment where different stakeholders feel they're not just included, but they belong. And the contributions are acknowledged and reflected in the final outcome of any process. There's a lot going on right now in our district. Um, and your hands are more than full. So I would like you to think of it as a suggestion as you look at the next six months and forward. This is something which is a work in progress the way I see it. In your thoughtful work and willingness to work with all stakeholders and taking your work to the next level lies the true success of our public school system which not only impacts children and community today, but sets the course for generations to come. Thank you. So I just wanted to um, reflect back on what I like about when you do, we've done these in the past and do it now, is it really, it highlights how massive the job of the superintendent is. And I think that what we see is what we're looking at here in front of us and there are so many things that you are involved in that I don't think most people that are out in the public have any idea of just how broad the scope has to be of what you're carrying and I I want to commend you on the vision that you bring and kind of go back to when we were doing our strategic plan last year and looking at was that last year? When was that? Was last winter? Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, but in looking at kind of moving from there to kind of moving forward to then when talking about looking at the vision for the public schools, looking at ten years out when we have this very large increase in your out of the box solutions, your willingness to take the feedback of a lot of different people and to try to balance that all in bringing forward the budget and bringing forward kind of where we're going from here because we're obviously kind of just on the cusp of some really big things and I think what happens here not just in this budget cycle and what we're doing in this academic year but in the next couple is going to have really massive implications for the larger future for the public schools here in Hopkins so I just want to commend you on bringing vision to the table and kind of bringing us to a place where we're I, I believe ready to kind of springboard off in spite of the challenges that we have already. So. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone good. else have any other thoughts that you'd like to add? No, I feel like I'm you know, I echo what you've already said. I feel like I don't need to repeat it all, but I think your strength has certainly been communication and I think that the um, the the community, I mean, there are folks who have expressed their appreciation for the information that you provide. I think your blog is awesome. I think it's been really well received and people are reading it. They're not just getting the link, but they're clicking on the link and reading it. So I think that's a huge win. I think that the things that you um, record on HCAM, I just saw one right before I got here, showed up on social media and it already had like 100 views. So I don't know if it was just by default yet, but, but I think that, you know, you have, you, there hasn't, a new outlet for communication hasn't been invented yet. You've used them all. So I think that that's a huge, um, you know, it's, it, it's a compliment to what you've been doing. I think that's huge. And, um, and, and that's, I think, where everything sort of comes from. As long as folks know what's going on, they may not like it, they may love it, but at least they know what's going on. So, you know, that's the thing. As long as we can educate ourselves about what's happening in the schools, 
step one is, is really fig figuring that information out, knowing where to find it, and you provide it. So it's great. Well, thank you. Yeah, I agree 1,000%. I mean, I think there's just so much happening, and there are so many taxpayers and citizens who are just um, trying to keep up. And uh, without a superintendent who makes it a priority to share and be transparent and get all the data out, um, we would, you know, people wouldn't understand where we are. They, we wouldn't be able to come to town meeting and understand the needs that we have. And, you know, I think all that tireless effort on your part has really paid off, and I, I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's great for us too because we also are, you know, parents and have jobs and whatever. So, it, you, you know, your openness has helps us keep and do, keep up to date and do our jobs too. So, well, one last thing that I will say about it is, you know, as I was reading through some of those indicators, you noticed that I would use a first person plural pronoun or say the school district. And, you know, I could never do this job independently of the leadership team. All of the building principals, the assistant principals, everyone who's a director, director of finance, technology, special education, curriculum, all of those people are amazing leaders as well. So I really have been blessed with the team. Dr. Kavner, you have more on uh, your presentation tonight? Just a little bit. Yep. These are just my happenings in our schools. Uh, those are uh, four freshmen, I believe, who did uh, high school quiz show. I think you'll remember that when Mr. Bishop was here, he had said that he was going to be their advisor because he hadn't had one. Um, the quoted material there is uh, what high school quiz show had to say about our new and young team, and we are really hoping that they will stick with it because... Uh, we see great things for them in the future. Uh, this came from um, our athletic director, Mr. Cormier. Uh, boys basketball, four and one, including a thrilling overtime win over Westwood on Friday night of last week. Girls basketball, is it three and one? And that's nice, because they're a young team. Swim and dive holds a record of four and two with a number of individual swimmers um, and relays having already qualified for sectionals and or states. Uh, boys hockey is 7-0, and which is fabulous. Um, they won the Metro West Daily News Cup, mm -hmm. and Coach McPherson had his 100th career win in a 3-2 win over Medfield when we had the season opener. Track and field, both of our teams are 3-0 and with terrific performances across the board. Um, a number of our students have already qualified for states, and Kate Powers also won the shot put at the state freshman sophomore meet this past weekend. Wrestling is off to a strong start, going uh, one and one in duels and having success at their weekend quads tournaments. Uh, Jake Sokol and Lucas, D Lucas Dion both won individual championships um, at the Natick duels this past weekend. Alpine Ski is gearing up for their first race. That was today, actually, at Ski Ward in Shrewsbury. Um, our girls hockey team won their first game of the season last weekend. They're two and one right now, and gymnastics is two and four, but just turned in their best score um, in their competition about against Marlboro um, last weekend. So that's where all of our sports teams are. I report on a lot of things, and I thought I should have a little sports update in I'm there. I'm so glad you did this because so many of the winter sports are off campus. Yes. So you know, obviously we're not skiing in the back on the back you know turf. So the hockey is in what Marlboro and. Um, yeah. You know, swim is a keeve, yeah. and so I think we forget how many athletes are involved in sports. Yes, right now, and how many teams we have going all at once. Yeah, yeah. you're right. And a lot of the winter sports are off. They are in off different campus. towns, even. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's no secret we have more teams than anyone else in the Tri Valley League. So, uh, this is the Rad simulation. Uh, that Mrs. Barat was talking about. So you can see that we have some police officers and uh, some of our girls and some of our teaching staff, um, but it really is an amazing um, simulation. Uh, so, you know, we keep guidance counselors on hand because the girls get so emotional that, you know, even um, Lombardi, our therapy dog, goes to this. So it's, it's something to see. And unless you've actually seen it, it's hard for me to articulate how amazing it is. Uh, Mr. Bishop had asked me to inform people that um, on January 23rd, um, there's going to be a presenter, John Mattelman, who's going to do the Secret Lives of Teens. It's here in the high school at 6.30. Um, it is supposed to be very good. So uh, 
when you leave, you should have all kinds of strategies and things that you will be able to implement immediately. So we are encouraging people to attend that. And there's no school committee meeting with it, com and there's competing with it. No meeting. school committee meeting in case people wanted to view. And then I just had one quick update, and it really came um, as a result of attending the Board of Selectmen meeting, uh, the Select Board meeting on Tuesday evening. Um, at this point, uh, Mr. Kamalo, our town manager, did indicate that uh, our increase was at 8.9%. Um, they sort of revised their recommendation to 6%. Um, and so what he says is that the schools are now, um, we're at 1.4 million uh, that sort of needs to be kind of made up there. Um, well, it's 1.6 million above the budget guidance, right? So I wanted to go back to that slide where we pull out how many classroom teachers we're asking for, how many um, FTEs and student services. And if you look below the yellow line where we have sort of those support departments, building and grounds technology, those are the places where we would have historically made the cuts that we kind of needed to make to help us to balance our budget. But if you look at that, that's about $375,000. That doesn't even come close to what we need to make up. So um, my concern is that uh, without that 9% or the 8.9% 8 budget, uh, we would be really slashing those 13.5 FTEs for classrooms and the requests that we have for student services. Um, so I, one more time, I just need to underscore how important all of those positions are. You've seen class size tonight. Um, you are able to see where we are in first grade, second grade, third grade, and if we are predicting, and I think that the number is 236, if we look at the numbers that the demographer had given to us, uh, we really need those those teachers or we're going to end up with class sizes that are astronomical next year. Yeah. So just for clarification, is that to be interpreted as they are, the town manager is pu pushing us to cut $1.4 million or looking for revenues to make up the difference or some and maybe you can answer this better than I can. I, it seems it to me my, that's alarming to hear that what he was saying is that sort of given the revenues that we have in place, um, it would be difficult for him to go above a six percent budget message for the schools. Yeah, I mean, you know, it is as you know, we always talk about the budget process is very long. Um, but the bottom line is the, the revenues will not make up. You know, there may be some, some changes, some slight changes. The um, first budget, I think, hits the, um, from the, the governor um, towards the end of January. We've already put in, or I won't say we, a town manager has already put in an estimate of what that increase in revenue would come from any state budget. So that has already been taken into account. So any adjustment in revenue looking forward at this point will still be really quite small. Um, there may be some adjustment in the budget requests of all departments, not just the school department, um, but also uh, across the town. So again, that may shift that 1.4 uh, structural deficit slightly, but not much. That was my concern, was that's a lot to, and when we look at these, what it would mean taking out of the budget, I think there are a lot of people who would be alarmed. That's correct. That. To see this. Yes. I, and I, I think I, I'll just quickly say that you used the, um, the FTEs that we have, you know, as a demonstration of this because there's no way that you could even go near the expense budget and make the reductions necessary to cover the 1.4 million. Well, but even if we did, I mean, well, like almost 30% of the expense budget is buses, and we right. we have to move our children. Like we don't, that's yes. not negotiable. So much so. of what we see, I mean, because they're actually human bodies that need to be moved and educated and right. yes. so forth. We're kind of. And I don't want people to feel like, you know, at this point we are, you know, at odds with the with the town at, in creating this budget. We really have been working hand in hand with them. I mean, numbers are numbers, and, and this, these are just the way that they're playing out. So we think it's important for us to continue to update people as mm -hmm. to where the numbers are. Right. When they talk about revenues, do they, is it based on a certain assumption of a tax increase? Like what kind of, what is the assumption that's built into what they're projecting as available revenue? 
I think with projected new growth, did he say that we were get the schools were getting 87 percent of the projected new growth? Was that the number? 80, right. 82. So I mean, you're lo you're locked 83? into Prop two and a half. Sorry. Yeah. So you know, Prop two and a half, that's finite. So th that's your number, and then you have new growth. So again, if you go back to what I was saying um, earlier with one of the questions, those two numbers added together is like 3.7 million. Our request for that 8.9 percent is 4 million. So we take up every piece of revenue, just about okay. anticipated revenue for the town, you know, based on our our request. Okay. And and this is the problem when you get into a situation with such extreme growth. If you look at the budget package that's in tonight's between 2017 and then including um, the projection for 2021, it's over 600 students. Right. So that kind of growth, you know, you're you're just trying to accommodate and you know put teachers in in front of kids, but revenue when you're locked down by Prop Two and a Half cannot keep pace with that. So Prop Two and a Half becomes binding. But in, in previous years, we've had many years of excess levy capacity, have we not? So is this assuming that we will tax to our fullest capability? Or this, this is assuming taxing okay. to the levy. Uh, to, That's okay. correct. Okay. Yeah. Oh. So in, in previous years, there has been excess levy capacity um, that was then taken off yes, the I table agree. through an underride. And the thought process that was discussed by the select board at the time is it is not prudent of them to keep taxpayers' money yeah. at the time where there is not a request. And when there comes a time where there is a request, which is now where we are, it is prudent to let the taxpayers make that decision yeah. um, since it is their money, if mm -hmm. you will. So. In previous years, we've done that underwrite, and we have not taxed to the levy capacity. What we're showing here is taxing to that full levy capacity, but you can see we're now asking for beyond, and that's where that 1.4 structural deficit for our request at this point in time stands. Thank you. I was actually uh, very glad, you know, uh, after the meeting, not so much about the number, <laughs> right? Uh, we still have work to do there. I think this is just the first round. I think there are going to be long, many, many conversations and trying to figure out how best we can accommodate uh, the needs that we have, not just on the school side, but overall. Uh, but I was excited with the fact that it was not a surprise for you, which meant that there's been work going on, there's collaboration going on. So to me, that that's mm -hmm. a great um, thing to see. Also, when the CFO spoke with us afterwards, he talked about you know the 83% of the new growth has been budgeted for the schools. And only 17% is going to safety in other departments. So the needs that have been presented from the school side are certainly topmost, it seemed like, of course, again, we, we still have conversation to be had. Um, I also um, heard of an idea that is being presented with regard to two buses coming from Legacy as something that the town could take on. I think it's very early in the conversations. Is, is that right, Ms. Rothamek? That's very early. I'm not sure that we should get into that just yet. Okay. Um, so there are some other ways that uh, uh, that's being looked at. There was also a brief conversation about the host community agreement and the money. So there, uh, my understanding is our town manager is working. Uh, so there is some funding there that we possibly could tap into. In, in theory, that money would be roughly equivalent to $1.4 million. So that would roughly eliminate our situation. Right. <laughs> At the same time, that could do it now. But when we put in this kind of money, we are, we are increasing our baseline. So what will we do next year? Right. And I think that's tricky if we're eating into our new growth at any percentage. But certainly, if we're taking into 80, 83% of our new growth and our new growth starts to slow down, I think we're in just <coughs> as big of a problem. So I don't know. Right. So we do it's need to look at those down. other um, yeah. Yeah. avenues. Actually, one of the things, I mean, again, this is small money, but small things add up. Um, a community member reached out about HEF grants 
that if you could tap into that, uh, it seems that last year there weren't as many applications, so they seem to have some pool of money. So how can we utilize more of the Education Foundation grants? Uh, I know you all work very hard to look at other new grant uh, avenues. We had talked a little bit about Carolyn um, Representative Dykema's willingness to work to put together something around innovation, um, education, you know, anything innovative in education as one of the options. So I think these are things that we have to keep in mind. So this is mm -hmm. good that we have some clarity on mm -hmm. where we are. Now it's about thinking, okay, how much of it can we fund through other ways that we have possible, uh, possibly do, right? I think the one other, sorry, I'm, you, you, I spoke last, go ahead, no, you can go. Um, well, you know, as you said, we are locked in with transportation, special education, and contractual obligations. So there is not a lot of wiggle room except for with these new positions. But I also don't want to run into the same problem we've had in years past where, for example, we've cut positions and then in October, mm -hmm. we're being it's presented like a with a new, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's been a couple of years in a row now where, you know, a principal will come in and say, I need two teachers. And we're like, yeah, you needed them last year too, but we cut them from the budget. And now we have to, you know, hire two new teachers in October, which is not an ideal time to hire, you know, a teacher. So I think, you know, touching the, I, I know these are significantly down from what was originally asked too. How, what were the number of full-time positions on the initial ask? 50 something? Oh, like 57? Right. Is that the right number? So we've cut from 57 to 20 something positions um, from what the principals presented as a need initial need. Um, so things have been cut in half, essentially. And uh, with full appreciation for the financial situation that's going on, if we meet that $1.4 million by touching any of these in October, the school committee will be sitting here approving new positions for buildings that need teachers with class sizes of 30 students. Which is hugely disruptive for students. Extremely and disruptive. And families, let alone teachers. But exactly. for students and families, we've heard that when we've done it in the past few right. years. We've right. heard that back from the parents. So I think, just to take that into account, because you know we're for sure stuck between a rock and a hard place, but with the kids as the focal point, we can't reteam students again. We can't, you know, take a teacher who's just getting to know her kids and then rip five kids from that classroom to create another classroom. I just don't think that's a good way to run a school. And I think that, you know, we're in a tricky spot, but we got to keep the kids sort of in mind when all this is going on because what's best for the kids is to start school and be with their teacher and, and get a good education and not be ripped out of the classroom and six weeks. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I guess I'd also like to add uh, the fact that when we do those things media, right, it's disruptive from a standpoint of, of the kids. And, you know, it's a shift, right? I think that's a lot to do with the projections. If we go off the projection, that's when we start to shift around. But typically with Ms. Rothamick's, uh, you know, she runs a tight ship. She has managed uh, to move things around, but would that result in some other, you know, harakiri even has to do? Uh, those are challenges which I think we will continue to live through for many years to come. Um, I also think um, one of the things we had floated around and talked about, and I think something that came from um, our, uh, our taxpayers, is a long-range plan. Mm -hmm for uh, resources, human resources. You know, we're talking about buildings, right, which is an absolute need in terms of space. But we also need to think about long-term needs. Let's put all those needs on paper. You know, you're already presenting what has been cut down, right? So what is the need that we have and which are the ones we are continuing to push? And there comes a point you cannot push any longer. Right, a classic example is that $60,000 on the technology front, right? We have pushed it around for quite a bit. This is the third year at least. Right, mm -hmm. so, so those are the kinds of things, I think, giving the transparency to the community that, you know, this request came in five years ago. Right. Um, so we need to figure out how we can fulfill and being a little creative, I know creativity can only take you so far, but still um, looking at those, but a long range plan on human resources, I think is absolutely needed because that's our big budget, 
of our overall budget is staffing. That's why I think it, the capacity study output, and I know there'll be a blog series, looking forward to that, um, but I think the concept of, you know, maybe that combined school, mm -hmm. having some shared maybe centers of excellence, that, that, so we don't have to have redundancy um, that's maybe underutilized to full capacity in each school, but rather have those schools together, maybe share some centers of excellence or some um, services that we then don't have to repeat. You know, mm -hmm. things like that. I'm excited about hearing more about those opportunities. Um, the only thing I would throw out there is I know that it's always so tempting to look at the administrative headcount that's not directly in front of teachers. And the people that I talk to who are, you know, their guidance counselors or teachers or whatever, it's difficult for them. They have, the work has to be done. There's a lot of paperwork that has to be done. There's a lot of, um, you know, with our students with unique needs, a lot of those things need to be documented and tracked. And, and a lot of the administrative support positions enable those teachers to actually teach and, you know, maybe not spend as much time in admin. So I worry, like, even with things like the website, the community wants information Right now, it's the teachers and the principals who have to come up with that. Like we, you know, it's all sort of one body of, of human beings, and they have to get the work done. And with, if we cut some of those administrative support positions, that work will just fall on the teachers and the principals and take them away from students. And you know, and I think the way, at the staffing levels that I see, we're not making, in the most cases, ideal class sizes. We're making manageable class sizes. So. We don't have a lot of cushion to then add administrative functions on those teachers as well. So, yeah, yeah. My hope again is to make this available for the community to know what's coming up for mm -hmm. them. Um, you know, if we are able to put together, I know it's so easy visually. I'm thinking a 10-year plan. This is the number of students we are expecting. These are the space needs. This is what we're going to do in year one, year two, year three, and so on. Here are the programmatic needs. I do think there are programmatic needs mm -hmm. that come with changes. You know, we are in space age, I feel, at 2020. <coughs> you know, 2030, 2040 is not far. What will be the needs at that time? You know, there's so many changes in the past 10 years in terms of programs. We do want to be able to shift some of those. So what does that shift look like? What are our teaching staff needs? What are support staff needs? So if that's visually made available and understandable for our town members, our taxpayers to see these are some of the things coming up, I think it helps people be prepared that we're not always acting surprised. I think we have moved past the acting surprise phase. Uh, but uh, yeah, this is reality. Right. So hopefully we'll continue this work. I, I'm very positive um, that we'll continue this conversation. I felt like our select board members have been extremely supportive mm -hmm. um, this year, especially with uh, what we did even at the special town meeting. I mean, the town resoundingly supported the ask. Mm -hmm. So I have every hope that uh, we'll continue this work. Right. Is there anything else that you have, Dr. Kavno? Yep, that's all. Thank you. Are we still in the superintendent's report? Yes, we are. About one hour. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we moved into, uh, I spoke a little bit um, on to the chair report, I think. Um, so moving on to the next item on the agenda, the chair report. I have approved warrants, number 20-033, number 20-034, number 20-035, and number 12-036. Warrants have been included in your packet. I have approved payroll warrant number S20013 and S20014. Warrants have been included in your packet. I, I thank, uh, thank you, Nancy. I think uh, you have held it and signed. I signed the warrant. Uh, so, thank you for that. Um, I have a couple of other updates um, with regard to the chair report. I spoke a little bit about our select board meeting. Also at our last school committee meeting, a few questions on the MSBA process came up. Um, and I reached out and spoke with an official who gave an excellent insight. You know, we had received that letter uh, mm -hmm. from MSBA to reach out. So I was more interested in um, the, their findings report. Mm -hmm. Um, so I have the following to share. I know Dr. Kavanaugh has already shared a lot of information there, so I just want to add a little bit of what I heard um, was that of all the applicants, um, 22 <coughs> sites were, uh, site visits were had, right? Um, so you remember last year we didn't have a site visit even though we applied. So there were 22 uh, site visits ever had, and in addition there were 13 uh, that were in consideration from 
last year. So they don't make a site visit apparently every year. Uh, that if they have just had a site visit last year, nothing has changed, so they've kept it. So there were 35 uh, applicants. So they felt that it's a step I've, uh, uh, forward if someone has come for a site visit. That's how I understood it. And she made the following um, suggestions. She, she talked about the fact that if we are making some grade reconfiguration ideas, it's very important that community readiness and backing exists. Um, and so. Um, this is actually in line, I felt, with what Representative Dykema had talked about, that how can we bring, you know, the community along, right? Um, there was also, you know, this is something very minor, um, that the, with the statement of interest that that requires some tweaking, uh, that there is some inconsistency in the language. This is a minor. Um, but also that the report, which is what uh, I was most interested in, uh, of the site visit will be available in late summer. So these were some of the things, and I know there are more questions. I've certainly reached out to folks because, you know, when you presented it last time, uh, Dr. Kavanaugh, about uh, the feasibility study and how we need to move forward, and you talked about the known risk that we would be undertaking of the 30% reimbursement um, with regard to both the feasibility study as well as the long-range uh, buildings that we are talking about if we would end up in a situation that we don't get reimbursed. So we just need to walk into it knowing and just make sure that we have the community buy-in and understanding of what we are embarking on. Um, so I think, I think that's work to be done. Um, I also had the opportunity I mentioned earlier to attend the RAD session. Um, the group study committee discussion was also very interesting, um, again. Uh, for me, it was of interest because of the seniors. Uh, I don't know if I would have gone if it was not at the senior center. Um, and one uh, particular topic that I brought forth to the small group was to keep an eye on the future turnover at legacy farms. You know, if it happens, turnover happens in other areas in the town, that's one thing, but Legacy Farms is very densely populated. So can we kind of have some idea of what those, if there is any turnover, what that would look like? And would we end up in a situation where we will again see a certain uh, spike, if you will? It may not be an immediate spike, but if people are, you know, as kids graduate out of school, do they move out? Right. Um, so um, again, no one can tell right now what their decision will be 10 years, 12 years from now. But we need to keep that in mind, I think. Um, I also felt um, the other aspect that came up was um, while there, is, there were some long-term conversations for seniors and how they can be supported through the growth, um, but also for the short term, how can our seniors use the spaces we are building? I really think we need to think about that and making sure they feel that um, they can use these spaces that we are building and community members get involved in knowing our seniors more and incorporate programming that celebrates them and their contributions. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm very glad we have the top of the hill, which regularly celebrates. Mm -hmm. uh, we have plenty of programming, but we probably need to look at more. Um, and right into that goes in, uh, the senior center director reached out about the Dementia Friend and Champion program, if anyone's interested. It's coming up next week on December 15th, but if there are, there are likely going to be other opportunities if anyone's interested. Uh, we also received an invite from the Hopkinton Chinese Asian uh, Chinese American Association to attend the Lunar New Year celebrations. Hopefully, uh, many of us will attend. Uh, also, I wanted to check in. I shared a little bit about our calendar uh, planning for the next three months. We haven't had an office hour, office hours in a long time. I mm -hmm. guess we've been so busy with the special town meeting and you know, public hearings, and we had our, um, in December, we also had another capacity study, uh, public hearing. So I'm just wondering what everyone's interest is for office hours. I, I think office hours is important to, to continue to offer, particularly as we're coming up on a big <coughs> ask of the community. Right. Um, that said, I, my personal availability would depend on what dates we were looking at. Okay. 
Definitely in advance of the vote. That's, yeah. So before February 3rd, let's try and do one. At um, least a week before, just so that people yeah. can come forward. Sure. I agree. Um, are there any suggestions on where we could host it? Where have we had, uh, where have we not hit that might be a... We had one that we had discussed a number of areas. Are there any from that we, list we did. that we didn't we, we did. hit yet? Uh, which we haven't, which, uh, you know, we have the Hopkinton 101 coming up sometime in the first quarter, which happens at the library. Yes. So that's right. got to be, is that March typically? Um, I think it's between February and okay. March. Then we would also have... Um, a few other events that are coming up, but we did Legacy Farms last year. Mm -hmm. But I would also be open to looking at any other new community that's coming up. That's uh, Could we think about doing a booth um, maybe like 45 minutes before and 15, up to like 15 minutes after the start of the basketball game? On a, mm -hmm. you know, oh, that's they, an excellent yeah. idea. A lot of people come yeah. to see the the basketball games, or it could be a different yeah. one of those mini athletic events. But mm -hmm. absolutely, um, higher right attendance people and come and, and they're fun. And actually, people with younger kids come too, just to watch. You know, it's a Friday night yeah. fun thing to do. Mm -hmm. So that's a good idea. Right. Usually, down in the lobby outside of the cafeteria, yeah. we could find a corner or. That's a nice idea. We're going right in front of the door. Right in front of the door. And I get by and right the tickets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Must ask a question before you. Can. That's right. Um, is so maybe we can look at the schedule and figure out a date yeah. that would be. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Is anyone volunteering here to kind of coordinate? Depends on when the I'll look at the schedule. schedule. Depends on when the day. Are you willing to do that? Sure. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank oh. you, Amanda. Um, so that sounds good. Um, do, will we have a? Maybe we'll talk about it in the next updates. So that's what I have for um, the chair report. Really. <coughs> uh, moving on to the liaison reports. Have anything this week. Um, Nancy, do we have a confirmation on the timing for the 25th? Maybe you have sent an I am, email. I am. I have not. I am waiting to hear okay. back. For, I know that Dawn has been in contact with. I am blanking on the um, visions director, the the gentleman that you, and I think Amanda had met right, with. Right, right, right. Oh, he's um, great. I'm looking uh, forward to it. Yeah. She is confirming with him the the exact timing on that. Okay. Um, I was also wondering, on the 27th, we had said we would do a mid-year review of the school committee goals. I know January has been tiring. It's a lot going on. Is there interest um, on doing it on the 27th? Should we try to do it along with the school committee meeting? We don't have a meeting on the 27th. We don't. No, it no. was just earmarked yeah, as a Monday. I I think I would prefer to keep it on an already scheduled. Yeah, yeah. If, if we can, okay. if possible. Okay. Yeah. So let's try and figure out the first meeting in February, perhaps. Then, does that work? That's good. Sure. Yeah. That's the sixth, yeah. I think. It's according to this. Okay. Okay. That gives us time for those of us who haven't started on some of those <laughs> goals to get started. <laughs> okay. So that's great. All right. Um, so we'll move on to the new business now. Uh, Owners, Project Manager, and Design Services, Dr. Kavanaugh. Right, so we were at the uh, Board of Selectmen meeting, and um, we have been sort of given the authority to take on that project because it's in excess of 500, th well, it's in excess of, of the minimum. Um, so I am rec requesting that the school committee authorize um, our Director of Finance and Operation, Mrs. Rothmick, to negotiate and execute a contact, uh, contract with whoever the highest ranked vendor is uh, for the OPM in an amount not to exceed the cumulative $500,000. I like the team. It's a dream team put together with between um, Ms. Parson and I mean, the, yeah, it's a good team. Yeah. It's a good team. So I think that team will do a fine job. I would make a motion to. What do I have to say? Motion to. So moved. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. so, so moved. moved. Yeah. I will second that. All right. A motion by Amanda and uh, second by Nancy. Any discussion? I have one question uh, for Dr. Kavanaugh. Dr. Kavanaugh, you talk about the highest ranked vendor. Could you speak a little bit to that, please? Well, I'll let you do that because you're going to run that. So in the RFP, it has the criteria that we are looking for, um, projects that they've done, um, what is the qualifications of the team. Mm -hmm. And so we take that criteria and we set it to a numeric or highly advantageous, advantageous 
not advantageous. And so we rank every submission. And then we'll take the highest ranked, so each person on the team ranks every submission, and then we take that highest rank vendor, and we discuss among all of us that we agree this is the highest ranked according to the criteria that's set forth. So it's not necessarily the lowest bidder, but? No, you choose the highest ranked, and then you negotiate. Okay. So these, these are different, okay. different bids. Okay, I was hoping it had come a little lower. That's all. Yeah. But hopefully you'll continue to work on that. So we already have a motion uh, here on the table. Uh, all those in favor? Yes. yes. I'm a yes as well. So, so it carries. And the next item on the agenda, policy AC, non-discrimination and civil rights notice to students, parents, and employees. Dr. Kavno. Okay. So policy AC. I think we had just looked at last January uh, and at the time we were simply adding language I think about pregnancy or pregnancy related conditions I think that mm -hmm. you know that kind of minority status um, the language had just changed but one of the things that we found in taking these policies and putting them on the website was that AC had an appendix to it, and the appendix hadn't been updated since 2001. And so what we wanted to do was to eliminate that appendix and just sort of take the spirit of the appendix and include it in the policy itself. So the yellow lines there that you see highlighted, the district will respond promptly and equitably. That's all that has changed in this policy. What we would be asking to do is eliminate the appendix and add that yellow language. Any discussion? I did see that these policies that we're re reviewing did go out to the public. Was there any feedback on none? I didn't receive any either. Uh, however, this is the first time we're bringing it, so perhaps we should bring it back. I mean, I was quite comfortable. I, I think we tried to bring in some of the language from Framingham. We looked at mm -hmm. it, and um, this seemed mm -hmm. good to me. Um, okay. Speaking for myself, yeah. This particular policy seems um, heavily dictated by Mass General Law. There isn't mm -hmm. much, we didn't create There's the no wheel here. This right. is pretty much a legal requirement. So, and all of those trump our policy anyway. Yeah. Right. Right. Which we have extensive legal references on this. Right. Mm -hmm. I've, I felt pretty comfortable with it, but if it, you want to let it sit out for a little bit, that's fine. Right. Okay. That sounds good. Um, sound good? Mm hmm. Moving on to the next item on the agenda, policy ADC, tobacco products on school premises prohibited. Dr. Kavno. Okay. So with this particular policy, as Georgette and I were looking at them and thinking about putting them again on the website, we discovered that policy ADC, which is a general policy on tobacco products, and the student policy, which is JICG, and the one for staff and personnel, which is GBED, all had the exact same language. There was not a single word different in any of those policies. And so what we chose to do was to um, take policy ADC and um, we added some language to policy ADC. So in that opening paragraph, uh, we did add things like, um, products that rely on vaporization or aerosolization because that did not exist in our previous policy and we found that on the MAC, uh, MASC website um, but other than that this one uh, the general policy looks fairly like it used to just a question this is for all people on school premises students and anybody Right. That is correct. You know, the ones that are the A's are the general policies. Yeah. So um, it's and it's tobacco. So if somebody say ha, is doing smoking cessation with Nicorette gum or a patch or that that's separate because that's not tobacco. Right. Okay. Yeah. Just want to be clear because I think that had come up. Someone had concerns about um, cessation techniques yeah. um, mm -hmm. and didn't want to impede somebody's efforts to become healthy yes. and that came up I think last year in the conversation so I just want to make sure what do you recommend as a motion Dr. Kavno so you know I, I feel like this is a policy that is um, pretty cut and dry um, 
if the committee has an appetite to approve this one tonight, I don't see any reason why not to. I'm okay with that. However, we have typically given some time. Yeah. We, we brought things back. I don't know what. Uh, one of the things think. Well, we did speak about how um, our existing policy doesn't make mention of any kind of um, aerosolization or mm -hmm. anything like that. So, um, our thought was, if everyone's comfortable with it, we would rather get it on the books. If, if you mm -hmm. think there's more room for discussion, debate, or changes, <coughs> for sure we can hold off. But we want to make sure that we're consistent with the, our policy and what we enforce in our schools. Um, so anyway, that was the discussion. So you're suggesting we move forward with this? Well, I mean, yes, I am suggesting we move forward. But if anyone's not comfortable with it, it's fine with me too. We can wait till next week okay. or the week after. Whatever. When are we meeting? Why don't we bring it next back? Week. Because typically we have done at least two readings, right? So. And I think. Two, sorry. Go ahead, please. I think our. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, our handbooks get much more detailed about mm -hmm. like vaping and vaping. You know, do. I don't think they use, use it. Maybe they do, but I don't think they use aerosolization, aerosolization right. as that particular word. But I think they cover that product in detail in the handbook, which is also mm -hmm. policy. Right. Mm -hmm. So we have a little bit of coverage if we need to let it go another week or two. Okay, so maybe not next week, but the following meeting, we can bring this back. Um, moving on to the next item on the agenda, item D. Dr. Kavner, policy right. GICH. Yes. So as I had said, when we looked at, I have to go back to look at the actual letters of it, JICG, which is the policy that you have in place now, it led us to looking at policy JICH because we were a sort of a letter off of where MASC was. So when we looked at policy JICH, this is sort of verbatim what, um, MASC offered. Uh, and, and I like what they've done with this because uh, we now have to do by law verbal screening uh, with our kids and uh, we'll have to check to make sure that we are actually testing in grades seven and nine because you have leeway as to where you actually do that kind of testing. But that's something that we have to do now. And so I, I like this because it is updated and um, my recommendation to the committee would be to eliminate JICG because it is very outdated and think about adopting this much more modernized and up-to-date JICH. Now, would the motion be also um, to eliminate that other one that you talk about, JICG? I think yes, and use JICH in lieu of it. Um, so again, uh, you know, in terms of uh, BH, it's clear cut to me personally. Um, but again, going back with that iterative process, bringing it back, does that make sense to other uh, members on the board? I find it a little bit interesting. I mean, obviously, the world around us is changing, but we it calls out alcohol. It doesn't call it marijuana. I, I assume that's also lumped under quote unquote drugs. But mm -hmm. it's interesting to me where where we now have legalized. Mm -hmm. Marijuana, does that belong as its own word in our policy? Mm -hmm. That's I think a there's very confusion good point. about that. Um, or maybe or is it be. THC or TC, whatever, whatever the chemical is. Um, right. I don't know. Just a, just a comment. But obviously, MASC hasn't quite caught up or changed their mm -hmm. language either. Uh, I wonder if there'll be a new policy to allow it. Actually, medical marijuana. <coughs> I don't know. Yeah. Uh, okay, so perhaps we uh, bring this back to and also in the motion make that recommendation that we are recommending elimination of GICG. So, All right? Nancy, you have something to say? Quick question on GICH. Um, it, it lists here, and this is, I'm clearly not a medical professional, but it, it lists here prohibiting the use of any controlled substance. Are there any? legitimate uses that a student would have that they would need a prescription. There are some prescriptions which would be considered controlled substances, mm -hmm. I, w I would assume. But if anything were prescribed, it would go through the nurse's office. You know what I mean? Right. Okay, so it's not considered, it, it, okay, so it's okay that if they've taken the con controlled substance at home, it's that they cannot, right. if you're on, I would think something, 
maybe certain anti-anxiety or other type medications. Yes. Might be. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure it's not. Right. Our expectation is always that the nurse would dispense medications. It's, yes, of yeah. course. I and I'm. I was thinking the consumed. It, 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 I'm taking that in a different way. This means you cannot consume it on school property. Gotcha. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I, I, you know, those are very valid point, right, Nancy? So, in the sense that I think there is a demarcation between this and um, medically required, right? That's what you're talking about to make sure that it's. it's, a, that it's I, I, my question actually was was sort of a long, but it, but from what Dr. Kavanaugh was saying, it doesn't actually require them to be separated because the student wouldn't be able to carry medication on their own anyway. Mm -hmm. They would be in the nurse's office or it would be at home, but which does not fall use. under our policy. It does say use or consume. I mean, if you're being treated, eat the, yeah. you raise a good point. Like there might be something that should be stated that that would be administered by a school nurse or something. I don't know, but it's an interesting point. Now, is it true of um, high school students too, to get medication through the nurse? Well, they're, they're not supposed to. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. E even like they get, they can get ibuprofen and Tylenol and things like that through the nurse as well. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Um, so it looks like there's some work to be done, um, some considerations, and we'll bring this back, much like the others, just to give that iteration. The next item on the agenda: policy GLF mandated reporting of suspected child abuse and neglect. So that was brought to my attention by Dr. Zaleski and the team chairs. Uh, as we looked at this policy, you know, we realized that a lot of the language in here was very outdated. Instead of um, saying things like DCF, it would still said DSS. It hadn't been updated in a very long time. In fact, it's 2002. So as we read through it, we decided that there was really no reason to keep this policy. Um, there, you know, Mass General Law obviously trumps the policy, and keeping this policy just has that tendency to sort of let it get stale. And the other thing that is true about being mandated reporters filing a 51A is that every fall, every teacher has to be retrained in that. So, you know, it's always sort of right there, mm -hmm. you know, in the forefront of teachers' thinking and administrators' thinking and paraprofessional thinking. Um, so it, it, it felt mm -hmm. redundant, I think, to, to keep this almost confusing mm -hmm. in some way. Um, so Dr. Kavanaugh, how do, um, uh, please, uh, if you can explain this again, in terms of how do teachers know about uh, this aspect? About filing 51A. Yes. Uh, when anyone is initially hired in the Hopkinton Public Schools, they have to take GCN training, which is about I don't know, 16 or 18 hours of online training. And being a mandated reporter and filing a 51A and the way you go about that is part of that training. And then after your first year, there is a refresher for particular things. So um, things like the difference between an IEP and a 504, uh, anti-bullying, uh, being a mandated reporter, all of those things are updated annually and every teacher is required to go through that process and then sign a document saying that yes, they have completed that training for the year. Right, okay. Um, I guess for, um, you know, again, speaking for myself here, on this uh, aspect, sure enough, it's um, driven by MGL, but we have a lot of policies that are driven by MGL. So um, I do think we should have a policy from a school committee standpoint, which you know, speaks to it that this is a mandated reporting, but it could be cleared up to simply reference the MGL as would be my inclination rather than simply eliminating it because um, this is a big aspect, I think, of the work that goes on to keep an eye out and report this, right? Um, the, that's um, my thought. The reference policy, if I'm not, if I'm, remember, if I'm remembering correctly, the reference policy on MASC's website is part of a, I don't know, there were a couple different, it's, it has like a little sentence and it says um, something to the effect of mandated reporting will comply with MGL laws. Um, and then there are a couple of other sections about unrelated communication. So um, this, in reading this, it's very procedural. It's a how to, like you, mm -hmm. how many days, and it, it seemed almost more like a procedure, um, which is where our discussion was, well, 
we could have a policy that says we will comply with MGL law, but that's sort of mimicking the verbiage of um, MASC. It seemed unnecessary. Um, this, mm -hmm. to me, it does kind of seem like a how-to. It says how-to report. It, it seemed a little bit too um, operational. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what our discussion was. That's why we're thinking we probably don't need this policy, but we can certainly discuss it. If you want to see the corresponding MASC. There isn't one. Well, it doesn't exist anymore. It, no, this particular letter, it was kind of in. It's student welfare, I think, yeah, was student the one. Welfare. Exactly. Right. Yeah, uh, to me, I think it's always helpful from a policy standpoint to speak to some of these aspects which are around. You know, child abuse and neglect is a big thing, and I think it does get captured in schools quite a bit. So I'm very happy to take the procedural aspects out, uh, but that's my inclination. And I don't know, there might be other policies of that nature uh, under our umbrella where we are directly following MGL. Um, so I don't know if there are things that we want to combine somehow. Um, Nancy, you have something to say? I, I guess it might. My take on this is really more from my capacity as a professional in, in the field of social work. Mm -hmm. And I do work fairly extensively with the Department of Children and Families. And the mass general laws are so um, tight for educators and, and any mandated reporters, social workers, health professionals, that it's impossible to imagine before any teachers are arriving here that they are not very familiar with how these laws work, how they, the procedure for filing a 51A is very clear just through the state and the fact that the school is continuing to train them. I don't know if we have someplace else with kind of in a combined policy where we would state something to the effect of we would, we comply with mass general laws regarding this, but I think that because some of these things do change from time to time, when I for example, when I was trained as a social worker, I, it was the Department of Social Services and the things that are in this policy would have been relevant. Mm -hmm. But those tweaks happen kind of occasionally from time to time and it, we have to follow whatever the actual law is regardless of what our policy is. Yeah, I think that the, the, the law has progressed and kind of gotten away from us. You yeah, know? yeah so. but, and, and that's... Mm -hmm. I mean, would you, as an educator, agree that in, in terms of what yeah, you see yeah. on the educator side? That, I mean, that was kind of our discussion was, you know, that a lot of times the laws will change before um, the policy manual will change even or that we'll get notified that the laws will change, but it's already, laws have already been adopted. Um, so if we, you know, if we talked about, you know, someone's comfort level and just saying, we will follow mass general law, you know, that's fine. Um, if somebody w still wants, or if anyone here is interested in keeping it as a policy. But I think, you know, like you said, no teacher is unaware of the responsibility and the procedural aspect is something that's dictated by the district, not by the school committee. So I think that, it, you know, the awareness of the fact that you are um, a mandated reporter that's sort of where you know it ends for us. And there are and fines and things else. associated right, exactly. with failing to report. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I mean, I'm open to either, but I I think that ours is like was already said too much procedure and really too in the weeds when it changes so often. And Dr. Zaleski didn't didn't she say it's not actually accurate? Right? It's wrong. Yes, there are some parts of it that. Right. Don't affect the current law. That procedurally, it's it's no longer a written it. report. Typically, it's typically done online. It's not. Yes. Yeah, so. Right. And there is that part that says you'd go to your building principal to ask if right. that person thinks that in fact this case warrants reporting, right. and. You know, certainly you That's would wrong. always yeah. collaborate with your building principal, but in the end, if you felt in your heart of hearts that you wanted to report, regardless of the principal's feelings, you have every right to do that. So, and responsibility. Right. And responsibility. So, in terms of next steps, perhaps, um, you know, based on what you've heard, just adding more work to the policy working group. Um, if you guys can think about it and come back in the next iteration with whatever is your recommendation, I think we'll move forward with that. Right? We could take another look at the, at the student, the model student welfare policy, which is where that their one sentence falls, hmm. and just see if 
I think they don't have this. This is outdated, so, but yeah. they, we can look at it. Their model for this one, I think you're thinking of the um, sexual harassment one, which is like two lines. Okay. This one is much lengthier, but basically. But this section is just a couple of sentences, right? Just on neglect. Uh, yeah. This right here, yeah. Safety and neglect is all here. Right. So it, I mean, it's you know, it's not just two lines, but it's short. It's much shorter than our current one. Very short. Okay. Okay. Uh, sounds good. The next item. Can we bring you move to the yep. next item? Yep. Next item on the agenda, item F, policy JH, student attendance, Dr. Kavanaugh. All right, so this one has also come back, uh, and I think that we looked at this one fairly recently too, it seems. Um, but the, the reason that this one is back is um, under extended absences. The policy used to say students who will be out of the school, out of school for extended periods of time, one month or more, should contact their building principal regarding withdrawal and re-enrollment procedures. Uh, we can no longer withdraw students who are traveling uh, and re-enroll them. Um, the fear, I think, is that uh, if a, a student is traveling and leaves the district, there's no one who sort of knows where that child is, right? So um, if we're anticipating that the child comes back and he's on our books, then you know there's that sense that somebody has an eye on him. Um, but now even when a student leaves the district and goes to another school in Massachusetts, uh, the receiving school will let Desi know that that child is there. So there's, there's very careful monitoring of where kids go across the state. So you're not allowed to withdraw anymore. So the only thing that would be changing is instead of saying with regarding withdrawal and re-enrollment, uh, process, it would simply say to contact the building principal to inform the school, just so that we have a sense that yes, they're traveling. We're still going to send all the mandatory letters at seven days. You know, we have to send you a letter saying your child's been out of school for seven days. And we tell families it, it's going to come, and they say, well, okay, we wish it weren't, but it is. Um, but this is really just one that just kind of follows the, the requirements by law. Okay. Um, so, shall we? Um, do the same as to bring um, this back for another iteration. Are there other thoughts, ideas, questions? Okay, so perhaps we'll bring it back just as procedural for a second reading before we move forward on it. Okay, um, next item, item G, criteria working group, Dr. Kavanaugh. Okay, so last time we were together, um, the question was raised um, about when you, you put together you know, a school building committee. And one of the things that we noted was that with the um, marathon school feasibility study, there was a criteria working group that got together. So we kind of went you know, into some historical documents. And the charge of that group was simply to say, what would you want um, a feasibility study to tell you. Um, and so what we're asking for this evening is um, a, a vote to say that uh, Mrs. Rothermick and I can co-chair a criteria working group to, you know, kind of lay out the, the criteria for a feasibility study. Um, and, and Dr. G uh, Kavanaugh, um, does this assume that we are moving forward with the feasibility study? It does. Um, uh, I guess for me, uh, one of the things that I was hoping for us to do is kind of do a debrief from the capacity study, some of the findings through them. I think we have a lot going on with regard to the construction and you know the planning with the high school edition and the portable classrooms and what have you. When uh, with MSBA not having invited us in yet, Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important to have the dialogue with the community a little bit more that what does this mean that we, we are possibly undertaking a known risk of this 30 percent that could fall on us. I do think that um, building is absolutely needed based on what we have seen, what we know in terms of the numbers. Uh, I think we should take some time with regard to the process to have those conversations with the community, vet some of these ideas that came up, some of the thoughts that came up at the capacity study results, just take some time. Um, I feel a little rushed with, uh, with this process a little bit. That's again just me, one voice speaking. 
Um, I wonder what other thoughts are. So I actually, I, I think I take maybe a different angle on it, which is I actually think that this will facilitate additional discussion within the community and that the criteria, having the criteria set up for what a feasibility study is going to be doing at down the line, whether it's we get goes through at this annual town meeting or whether it's in another year, mm -hmm. having that criteria set up for what we want that work to address. Are we looking to address space constraints? Are we looking to address any safety concerns, any, you know, things, what the community and, and the representatives of the community feel like the feasibility study should be looking mm -hmm. at so that it, it broadens the lens, elevates the level of transparency for how it, the community's ability to have input because it would be an open meeting. It would allow people to, to be part of kind of and see what's going on and, and to have a step before we get to that feasibility study, which I think is it, 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 we're going to, whether it goes through this year or next, we have to do a feasibility study or we're never going to get MSBA funding. Right. No, I, I hear about the need for the feasibility study. There's no doubt about it. I also felt a lot of these questions were to be addressed as part of the 50,000 capacity study. Right. So some of the findings exist there. And I, I think what we do need to have is a community dialogue. Right, whether it is through this working group or whether it is in any other form. Um, Dr. Kavanaugh had shared some of the findings of the last criteria working group. And to me, that, again, you know, this is just me looking at it. Um, what I would like to see is community workshops. The model that I have really, uh, you know, liked and appreciated in recent times is what the Growth Study Committee has done. I think they have conducted a series of workshops to uh, gather public input into the process, educate what this is all about, although their mission is different. Um, to me, the mission first is to have some conversations around uh, the MSBA findings to have some conversations around um, the capacity study findings, to have some conversations about the feedback we received at the capacity study findings. So that's, I don't know if this working group would address that. I think that it would. I, I think that I'm in agreement that um, if you want the community to start having conversations, I think that you have to organize somebody to generate those conversations. Mm -hmm. And I also feel like we've heard from the community, why is it that you are so ill-prepared to deal with the growth? Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like this is the way for us to begin not to be ill-prepared. Mm -hmm. I feel like this, I think I was someone who asked a lot of questions about the feasibility study at the last meeting because I was trying to figure out well, when we engage a contractor, we give them parameters, and what are the parameters that we're giving them? So I like the idea of this. Um, I was very nervous about spending $700,000 on something, because you get that far invested, and if we haven't set the parameters right, yes. we're going to be kind of in a mess. So mm -hmm. um, I, looking at the charter, where it says like to confer with community members, I was hoping that this body would do you know, some of yeah. what you're talking about and um, and get out there and, and have those workshops because I do think it has to be a broader conversation than like the people on this board. Mm -hmm. it, this is the steering group, but I think there has to be more um, engagement with the general pub public so they can talk about things and you know even if I'm remembering the capacity study results with all the color coding and the buildings and whatnot and mm -hmm. we kind of said well I know you think our um, our SARE stage is right. perfectly fine, excessive actually, I think is how it was coded, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, based on our community priorities, is that true? And I think we can look at some of those findings and some of our priorities and we can come up with what Hopkinton is going to, what our minimum is, and, mm -hmm. and that takes other voices. So I'm hoping, when I saw this I was excited because I'm hoping this group will help connect in those workshops. If this group came together and didn't conduct any community work, any community forums, and like sort of more than one, it's gonna to have to be multiple, then I would be disappointed. But if, if that's part of this purview, then I'm excited. So we're saying that this work uh, would lead us to talk a little bit about what this reconfiguration could look like. Is that right? 
I think that this group would talk about what they want the feasibility study to tell us. And would it also kind of look at kind of what are the problems that the feasibility study would be trying to address? What are the what are the scope of the issues of what would be the point, for lack of a better word, of going forward and, and what what solutions should the feasibility study be aiming to solve? Like what problems? Right. Like I think as I was doing my entry plan work and we had that, you know, Saturday morning focus group day, um, it was very clear to me that there were several people there who were very anti having multiple, you know, multi-grade schools, that sort of districting. Um, they really felt like if you had a school that was a 2-3 school and then a 4-5 school, there was equity for kids there. So, you know, maybe that's just you know, a small group of people who spoke on that day, but I think that if you're, a feasib if you're preparing for a feasibility study and you recognize that the town has no appetite for districted schools or has no appetite for schools that aren't districted, then that kind of comes out in, in that work so that you're not paying someone to say, what would it cost to do this kind of school and what, kind of, what would it cost to do that kind of school, when in the end, you know you don't want this one. Mm -hmm. and I actually right. think the capacity study, for me, the value of the capacity study was a statement of problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I was actually pleasantly surprised that there was a creative look at what a solution could be, because that wasn't what I actually expected. Mm -hmm. It was a, a detailed <coughs> statement of problem yeah. saying where our capacity is you know, inadequate mm -hmm. across the district. So I think it, that's like a really good input into this work, taking another a deep dive into that output and saying, given this district-wide set of um, constraints and, and struggles, how do we put it all together into a solution? Mm -hmm. They kind of threw one out there, but that was, you know, they're a little bit removed from our community and, and you know, it wasn't really their purview exactly the way I, I understood it, so. Um, so again, you know, for me, it's just being very clear what is the output and are we getting on with talking a little bit about what this configuration could look like to what you said, what are some of these um, criteria you speak to before we get into the feasibility study, what would be the output of the feasibility study? Yes. Okay. So um, we talked a lot with the capacity study about you know, building a sort of this mega school that would have schools within a school, two, three, and four, five, right? Which would vacate Hopkins. So maybe one of the things that you'd say to the person doing the feasibility study, Give us three or four options. What what could we do with that Hopkins school, right? And maybe that's not how it will go, but I think mm -hmm. I'm just using that as kind of an example. Right. I guess to me, I just want to go with a very open mind um, as to what that configuration could look like. Um, you know, to your point that it was very clear that we had this growth coming up. We had these 234 kids we are anticipating next year, and you know, a thousand odd kids in the next 10 years. And so, absolutely, work needs to be done. So, it should really be a brainstorming within the community mm -hmm. as to what is it that we want to do, right, and what's needed. So, I am all for that kind of a conversation. It wasn't very clear to me. Um, looking at the charter for this or and looking at the feasibility study report if um, that fits it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's ju just my thoughts there. And in the past that we had, I saw a bunch of people who were involved in it, um, lots of community members. I would really like, uh, you know, as if we go down this path of, you know, putting together a committee together, I would really like to see um, someone from the community, you know, we know there are some very strong advocates uh, who could partner and co-chair uh, with you perhaps or Ms. Rothmeck to lead this work in terms of getting community input, but go with a very open mind to hear all ideas. That's my It would be good to have multiple community members involved. Right. Uh, I guess also from a chairing standpoint, I think it's important that this kind of work, this impacts our community in a big way. This is the start of many, many, uh, you know, based on what I understand, multi-million dollar effort, which is needed. 
Um, so I think community buy-in is going to be extremely mm -hmm. important, making sure that every step of the way, the community is participating mm -hmm. in the dialogue. Okay. Um, yeah, we have to bring the community along. So I think sharing that responsibility with a community leader, uh, I'm happy, you know, a few names come to Sorry. my head, like uh, Mr. Markey. So, out of curiosity, the um, criteria working group that was done, that this was, this is modeled after what was done for Marathon, correct? Yes. Is that what you said? Yeah. So, um, I, I guess kind of looking at, do you have a sense of who, who actually chaired that? criteria working group because I, I would what, have to go back okay that's okay say, I don't need yeah, to know I'm right sorry. now but what it seems to me with marathon was done really well was the community was brought along very nicely mm -hmm. right. and I guess that's part of what excites me about this is it gives a starting point for kind of inviting the community and having some of the larger conversations uh, and then kind of mapping out the way Marathon did. After the feasibility study, we had these fabulous, that Mr. Markey was chairing that, the, that group that was looking at these focus groups in multiple locations in the senior center and different schools and including voices really along every step of the way. Right, and also Mr. Shepard, right? Mike he Shepherd. was there, yes. So I would look to see but, how we can bring um, some of that in, right? So I. I Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go. Jen, you have experience serving on that uh, MSBA committee. Uh, and, yeah, ESBC. Yeah, and I, center sorry. school reuse. Sorry, yes. And center and, school yeah. reuse, right. And growth Very committee. <laughs> no, I mean, of course, yes, I'd be happy to serve in this committee. But I think um, I, I, I like this committee a lot. I think it's a great idea, and I think it has to happen before um, the feasibility study. I think it makes great sense. I like that it, you've left it open. Um, in terms of, you know, Tamina's point about um, community members, it doesn't have a number to it, which is good and bad, I think, because I, if it gets too big, I mean, I think that the, the forums and the um, community workshops are where you want your big numbers, but the committee mm -hmm. itself, I think it's, sometimes yeah. it gets a little squirrely if there are too many people on the committee itself. Um, you know, who should be in charge of it? I'm in support of having you both being in charge of the committee just because I think you have the knowledge and the background to sort of get it started later on down the line. You know, I don't want to volunteer anybody, but you know, for example, you were not involved as chair or or even as voting member. Or were you a voting member of that? No, I was not. SBC, no. no. So I feel like <coughs> later on down the line, when and if a building committee is established, that's when there's a community spokesperson who sort of steps up and offers to chair that committee. And Joe did an awesome job on on the marathon school. So I think you you need people who are grounded in what has happened up until now. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's you too. And then once that <coughs> the information gathering and what people want and what the community wants is in one place, then that goes to the feasibility study. And then after that, that's when I think you start pulling in you know, your Mike Shepherds and your Joe Marquis, because I'm sure they're going to have not a lot to do once the SPC <coughs> is off. So they're going to jump on the next one. But I think it's. Um, I'm sure they will. Yeah. <laughs> we'll say it <laughs> right. Like true. Right, exactly. So I think I, li I like what you have here in its form because I think it gets the ball rolling. It's not the end-all be-all, but at least starts the process off. I think you're gathering information from lots of different places. And um, you know, I think things kind of evolves almost organically as, as you get the process going. So there will be community input for sure. There's lots of people who care about this. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's the way to start it. So anyway. the criteria working group from the last time was chaired by the assistant superintendent. Okay. Um, your building committee has to the, is comprised according to <coughs> the, the regulations put forth by the MSBA. Oh. Oh. So, so if you do not use MSBA monies. <laughs> right. But I think what we have said all along is we would kind of follow down and, and use their sense. guidelines. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, but word that like that's that's way far down the road right. you know? and it served us well in our last project so it, right. does, it makes yes. sense to keep it going this is help for the procurement process of right. the feasibility study right. Right. so right. And, and when you make the comparisons between this and, and the growth study I think you know to your point the 
the, our committee has met, our committee being the growth study committee, has met um, since September. And, ha and so we needed to meet several times in order to make the community outreach that we wanted to make on those two separate occasions. Those things wouldn't have happened unless the, f the committee was formed in the first place, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's kind of like pulling together what we think we need and then presenting it to the public and finding out, did, do we have everything, you know, what, what else do we need to include? Mm -hmm. um, and go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so, go. My question is about that date. That, that I was wondering about the, the May 14th date seems Aggressive. It's, it's definitely given aggressive. you know the formation the, in, and those meetings and all the research that has to happen to be smart enough to then have a conversation with the community. You know, I, I don't know. It just seems aggressive. I wasn't sure what was what you were thinking about the May fourteenth. Right, and I think that the reason that we went with a, a date like that, it, the last criteria working group began meeting on March twentieth, two thousand twelve. And they had their deliverable, deliverables by June seventh, two thousand twelve. Which I think, so, although you know, I think that kind of might make sense with one school. I mean, we've got this right. is sort of a cascade. It, it doesn't have to be, but it could potentially right. be a cascading set of school, you know, right. impacts. So, and I think, truth be told, we have no access to the feasibility study money until July first. So. You know, again, I, I think that, you know, in the same way we had the question about the calendar subcommittee, what if you're not done when the time comes? You know, there's, we, I don't think that there's any reason to rush it. Uh, Dr. Kavanaugh, one related question I have for you. You know, we didn't get invited into the process by MSBA, mm -hmm. uh, but what we are trying to do is get ready for the feasibility study and proceed with the, the recommendation is to proceed with that. Uh, what uh, would happen if we waited a year for the study and um, MSBA decided to participate next year? How far behind would we be? So what ends up happening is in that after you get invited in, there's a significant amount of time, like certainly well over a year before anyone's ever going to even put a shovel in the ground and that's the time that you would be using to do your feasibility study if you do your feasibility study now and you get invited in in december of 2020 the money is still reimbursable the 700,000. okay and um i know this question came up last time too was um how long are the results of the feasibility study valid in the eyes of the msba I think you answered that last time. Yeah, I don't know the exact, but I mean, it doesn't expire in a year, doesn't expire in two years. So, you know, it, it holds up for a good amount of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess, you know, just me being me, I, I think it's important. This work is important. There's just no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. I think the conversations need to get kicked off. But when we call it a criteria, uh, working committee for the feasibility study, it feels like we are committing to that process um, that's just ultimately we have to do a feasibility study we're not committing to a timeline of because we have no way of knowing having the feasibility study in place if you do get invited yeah. in it accelerates your pace yes you know. but whether the town approves the feasibility study this year or not it's still a good idea to do this criteria working group right now mm -hmm. it would be my opinion on that just one sure again yeah. this is just to help write the procurement yes. of yeah. it still has to pass town meeting. Right. 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 Yeah, uh, I guess I need some time to wrap my head around this a little bit. You know, just hearing some of these thoughts that mm. that is in fact uh, what we are talking about. I do care that we have those conversations in the community. That's uh, how I feel about it. Um, just to absorb some yeah. of it. Uh, and come back to that again. And uh, I do think we should have a committee Bless looking at it. Bless you. So do you, are you comfortable going forward with it and forming the committee then to at least begin the process? I'm, I'm very comfortable with it. I, I, I actually I feel, will, I was gonna say, I feel concerned if we wait any significant period of time because if we, it, it will impact our ability to do a meaningful feasibility study if we don't have these criteria mm. and it will further rush the, the actual process if we hold it up too long here would be my you know, when you were um, reporting during the, super, uh, the um, chair report about some of the feedback, I thought you mentioned, one of the things you mentioned was um, 
if we're looking at sort of grade reconfiguration of any kind, having more voices, mm -hmm. more input. So um, before we go back to MSBA, so I, I don't know, I wonder if this, mm -hmm. wouldn't this help us? That's what I'm not clear based on the charter that I see. I, uh, you know, again, uh, I would be more comfortable if I get a chance to think about this a little bit. That's me. Perhaps we bring it back next week and talk about, uh, you know, I don't know if that will change things, but it's up to the committee, not just me. I would feel more comfortable just thinking about it, possibly, um, you know, is that what we are trying to do here? Is not was not very clear to me on uh, the criteria as it's listed. That's all. I mean, I'm comfortable. I mean, I'm, I'm actually excited about this because I think this is what I was asking for. But I, you know, if we can put it on the agenda for next week, we're meeting again. If, mm -hmm. I mean, if that would make you feel more comfortable, then I'm okay with. I wouldn't want to wait long, right. especially no, when it's May 4th date, yeah. right? Yeah. If we could have Meg here, and yeah. you know, mm -hmm. it might be worth a one-week wait. I wouldn't. I, I I kind of agree with Nancy. I wouldn't want to delay. I'd be nervous about delaying because, and I would not want to move forward without doing this okay. and going into procurement process without some community-driven parameters. So I like that 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 this would get to that. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. So I'm in favor, but I'm willing to but wait a week if. I would agree with that. Is that okay with you, Dr. Kavanaugh, to bring it back next week? Sure. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for your patience with me uh, in just getting through this a little bit. Okay. The next item on the agenda is Old Business Policy GRD, Publication of Students' Photographs and Images, third reading. Dr. Kavanaugh. Yep. So, um, you know that we've looked at this one a few times, and I think that we waited until tonight to bring it back just to give folks enough time to you know, really look it over and digest it. You'll remember that initially it did say um, in the public domain, and that kind of threw people a little bit. But I think now we are in a place where this matches well the um, the policy that we have for the regular school year, and this just really includes um, ESY, so the extended school year work. Uh, this has been vetted through our legal counsel, and so I think that uh, it's in a good place. Uh, there was, was there any additional community feedback besides no. what we had no. originally received? Um, I remember there being some conversation. I, I was actually quite comfortable with the verbiage. Mm -hmm. The only thing I was hoping for was the opt-out option, um, or rather opt-in option, sorry. I, I keep uh, forgetting that, but I think you had mentioned that operationally that's a bit challenging. Is that mm -hmm. right, Dr. Yes. Kavna? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that was the only um, uh, aspect that I would have preferred, both from a liability standpoint and also from what the parents expressed. Um, but that's a minor thing. I don't know if I, what thoughts everyone else had. No, I'm comfortable. This is our third reading. I feel like we nailed it. And I, I, my recollection was the at the last reading, the reason we held off was because it, we just wanted to simply allow it. Nothing changed from last right, time. This exactly. time we just it's wanted to allow, and I, I believe it was um, posted on social media in the group the, some yeah. of the groups that are relevant to the Ten TSY. Minutes, yeah. Oh, yeah. that's great. Yeah. And everything was I, I did. I did not see anything that was cause for concern. That's great. All right. Um, so looking, f should we look to move? I move that we approve. <laughs> I second. Policy JRD. A motion by Jen, second by Amanda. All those in favor? Yes. 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 I am a yes as well, and so it carries. Thank you, <coughs> Mr. Kavanaugh. Mm -hmm. Um, the next item is future agenda items. Anything from folks? No? Um, I also perhaps want to use this time to speak a little bit about some of the requests that may have come up in the past and if um, there is a timeline for some of the things. I know some of the report requests have come up. Um, maybe those are things we talk about offline and at the next um, meeting when we discuss future agenda items, speak to is there a timeline for it? What is the criteria? For instance, we have talked about um, 
a report on transportation. We have talked about um, some other reports, so, you know, off, yeah. not coming off the top of my head at the moment. Um, but just speaking to maybe they're feasible, maybe they're not. Maybe there is more information needed. Um, maybe it'll happen next year. So just kind of uh, bringing some closure on the future agenda items that have been suggested. Perhaps circle we can do that, that, circle back, yeah. uh, and bring that for the next meeting. Great. All right, um, moving on to the next item on the agenda, public comments. Anyone wants to make We've them away. <laughs> <laughs> OK, uh, that sounds good. Items by consensus, Dr. Kamenow. All right, the superintendent, I recommend the school committee approve the items by consensus as outlined in your agenda. So okay, moved. Motion by Nancy. Second. Second by Jen. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. I'm a yes as well. Um, and that brings us to item 12, adjournment. Looking for a motion for adjournment. So moved. A motion by Amanda. Second. Second by Jen. All those in favor? Yes. Yes. I'm a yes as well. We're missing Meg there, aren't we? She's the first one. She moves one. things along. <laughs> <laughs> um, our next meeting is next week, uh, January 16th. Uh, at 7 p.m. We are looking to figure out if that meeting will be held right here at the high school or possibly at each camp to allow for remote participation by uh, Professor Tyler. Uh, that's it. Uh, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful night.